Well, they say three times a charm, but maybe it's four times a charm. Hey, everybody, welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. And no one is more amazing than the legendary John McDougall, who is celebrating his 75th birthday today with us. And it looks like it's working. Thank you for your patience, Dr. McDougall. In honor of his birthday, he's joined by his wife, Mary. And we're going to be giving away a couple of copies of my latest book, Unprocessed, forward by Dr. John McDougall. You need to stay till the end of the show and answer a few questions trivia questions about the McDougals to win, but you got to be watching on YouTube and you got to have a U.S. address. Without further ado, thank you for your patience, Dr. McDougal, and happy 75th birthday. Well, thank you. Uh, You know, I'm I'm lucky to be alive, (laughs) considering the way I've taken care of myself, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Did I have a chance to show people my birthday gift from Chef AJ, the shirt? Did they see it? They're seeing it now, and it's beautiful. They haven't seen it before? Okay. Well, this, is, <laughs> this is a hand-painted shirt. It, 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 um, oh, it's got birthday co- candles color- on. Colorful, to say the least. And I'm proud to wear it. And it will probably grab your attention so that if I make any mistakes today, you'll be paying attention to the shirt. But I'll do the best <laughs> I can. Yeah, 75 years old. You know how that goes. They, the, the common saying is, if I had known I was going to live this long, I'd have taken better care of myself. And oh, I want to tell you, before <laughs> before I met Mary, <clears throat> I was on a, a road to self destruction, smoking cigarettes. Of course, I smoke cigarettes too. <laughs> really? In fact, I quit for a year when I met her, and she started me again, and uh, <clears throat> drinking whiskey, and um, and eating terrible food, you know, pepperoni pizzas and hot dogs and so on. But we kind of <clears throat> got together back uh, over 50 years ago and decided life was so good uh, because we were together that we ought to change our evil ways. And mo- most of you know the story about Mary and I going from medical school at Michigan State University directly to Honolulu, where I worked as a surgical intern. In fact, I was not only a surgical intern, I also uh, manned the Queens Medical Center emergency room for a while. In other words, the poor people of Honolulu, they, they depended upon me when they got into terrible trouble, gunshot wounds and accidents and so on. As an intern. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> but I needed the money and they needed to somebody that could, uh, could do the job that I could do. Wow. Anyway, after a year as a surgical intern, we went to the big island of Hawaii and that's where we really, really learned about good nutrition from our patients. But we didn't really change the way we ate we didn't on the change. Big Island. I mean, we maybe started, a little bit. We started. ate we ate organic grass-fed beef. Brown, I think we went to brown rice too. Well, we <laughs> ate brown rice. And, and you know, I was, I was so convinced that the American diet, you know, the, the need for calcium and protein were so important that uh, many of you know our daughter, Heather, when Mary was pregnant with Heather, which is close to 50 years ago, uh, we attended a childbirth education class. And in that class were a couple of people that really changed our lives, uh, Buzz and Susan Hughes. And Susan was pregnant, of course, you know, she was in the childbirth education class. And I was so worried about her because she was a vegan and she was growing a baby in her uterus. And good grief, I didn't, I couldn't imagine that it would be healthy eating a diet with no animal foods at all. And so what Susan agreed to is if, if because it was clean, <clears throat> she agreed to eat fish if I would catch them for her in the ocean and bring them to her. I don't know whether she ever ate them or not, but I spent the in, entire pregnancy with, with, with a goal to make sure Susan got enough protein to, to of course, have a healthy baby. And boy, was I mistaken about, about good nutrition, about the needs of, uh, for a a fetus and a pregnant mother. And, you know, fortunately we got this straightened out so that our last child, we, we married ate well during our entire pregnancy. It was a really, really easy pregnancy. Anyway, that's kind of where we came from. And <clears throat> I believe it was 1977 that we had our last big, uh, probably, probably the last time that we ate any real meat as far as a meal plan goes. I, uh, it was back in about 1977. Probably. Yeah. And since then, we've been pretty good to ourselves. And the consequence is, is that we are alive. And I am <laughs> particularly thankful because most of you know I have a, t- a history 
which I deserved, uh, being a very, very sick young man. I was had terrible, terrible stomach problems and lost my tonsils and had endurance problems. And uh, at, at 18 years old, I had a massive stroke and uh, something I've lived with for the last 57 years, the residual of that stroke. Uh, <clears throat> and I was uh, 90 pounds heavier than I am now at one point, thanks to the hospital system, which gave me free food. And uh, I, I would not have made it to, to, to the end of my 30s, probably the end of my 20s. I would have been dead or at least had major heart surgery. But fortunately, my plantation patients taught me what a good diet was. And, if you don't know that story, it's, I think it's one that you could learn a lot of things from too. Uh, my first generation patients lived on a starch-based diet. In this case, it was mostly rice. It was uh, Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, Koreans were the plantation workers I was taking care of. And the ones that lived on rice and vegetables with virtually no meat, and no dairy, they were strong and healthy into their 80s and 90s. And you know, one, one of the things <clears throat> I'll tell this group because uh, Mary won't, wouldn't let me get away with telling any other group is one of the things that I uh, saw in my practice, I was a general practitioner taking care of 5,000 people. And one of the things I saw in my practice, which inspired me to learn what was going on was the elderly Filipino gentleman. And uh, anybody who knows about plantation practices, knows some of the traditional of, of people in Hawaii, you know how true this is. The elderly Filipino gentleman would work really hard his whole whole life and he would retire and he'd save a lot of money. And then what he'd do is he'd go to the, back to the Philippines and he'd essentially buy a young bride and bring her back and start a family. And so, you know, almost every day came into my office, this family unit of this 65, 75, sometimes 80 year old gentleman with a young wife in her twenties and two or three kids. And my initial thought was the neighbor was helping out, but no, this man was fathering these children. And also this man expected to see the kids grow into adulthood. And I had to know why, well, you know, I, I was probably 26, 27 years old. And I thought, gee whiz, when I get to be 75, which I am today, <laughs> I'm not going to the Philippines. Oh, okay, yeah. good. Fortunately, I'm, I'm very happy. Um, anyway, we don't have to get into that. But I, I, it gave me an inspiration to, rather than, than being half dead, you know, and medically retired, I, I would like to be doing what healthy people were doing that I was taking care of. And the healthy men and women that I was taking care of lived on starch-based diets, uh, rice, vegetables. You know, they had, they had chicken at the cock, cock if the, their chicken lost the cock bite on Saturday. Then they had a little chicken for the rest of the week, but that was it. And very few of them were fishermen, so they didn't have uh, fish, so they didn't get those essential fish fats, you know, that we might be talking about a little later on today. And boy, oh boy, they seem to be pretty smart. Anyway, that's where I got some of my initial uh, education. I don't think I've shared that with many of you before. But here I am, 75 years old, and I don't need to go into any details about how functional I am, do I? No. Okay. Well, we'll Forget it. <laughs> well, she'll believe you. Everybody Forget will it. believe you. I'm doing okay, guys. Oh, everybody's commenting how great you look and how the shirt is as unique and colorful as you are. You know, last time we spoke, I don't know if it's already happened. You mentioned you were going to be attending your 50th medical school reunion. Yes, yes. That's going to be <clears throat> this September. And it's been 50 years since uh, I graduated from medical school. And that's going to be something. I, I wish you could live stream from there. Compare yourself well, to all the other doctors. Maybe we'll be able to. You know, it's kind of interesting. I, I gave the, uh, you know, one of the reunion addresses, I was invited to give that to the Michigan State students. And so we had somewhat of a reunion. Uh, it was a 25th. Was 20, 20 years ago or something. Yeah, about 25th anniversary, I think, from graduation. And I gave that presentation. And I have to tell you, <clears throat> you know, I, 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 I don't mean to brag, but I guess I have to, is uh, most of my classmates said, you know, you look just like you did when you attended medical school. And most of them didn't, you know, they're overweight, they were bald. And, you know, the, the aging process was really evident with them. And, you know, hopefully, in fact, I asked my son last night, I said, we had dinner with you know, my, my birthday dinner was at his house. He's a medical doctor, a professor at OHSU. And I said, I'm really opening myself up for criticism, but I'm going to say it. I'm going to say, don't, don't, don't your mom and dad look younger than their stated ages? He, he didn't answer. 
<laughs> but I said, well, at least, at least mom, she, you know, she's a year older than I am. She's 76. I said, don't you think she looks pretty good? And he, he agreed. Yes, but he would not, he would not give me any compliments. So I'll have to. But, well, you have to tell him what Logan said. What do you say? Well, Logan said grandma looks younger than grandpa. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Hey, he's only six though. He doesn't. <laughs> that doesn't count, right? It counts. And he, and he was right. <laughs> and then we went out and we played ball together. You know, Logan and I did. And it was a nice birthday. I had a really nice time. What did but, they uh, make for your birthday? What they, oh, we, but my favorite dish, which is, uh, why don't you tell them what it was, Mary? Because well, you can describe it better. Craig, Craig makes this great uh, Japanese noodle dish. And he makes it with buckwheat noodles and uh, ramen broth. And so he, what he does is he cooks the buckwheat noodles separately. And they're... Um, you can buy them in any um, Asian market and in many grocery stores. They're the kind they come in a little wrapper around them. And, um, so you cook them for five minutes. And in another pot, you, uh, you cook the broth, uh, ramen broth. And there's a, a local market here in Portland that makes a really healthy ramen broth with no oil or extra salt added to it. And he makes a broth with a, uh, to tofu chunks, just plain tofu chunks and organic, organic, organic tofu. tofu. Which, and, which uh, all is. Um, <clears throat> and shiitake mushrooms. And then he, in another pan, he has um, a big pile of um, chopped um, bok choy or charred um, broccoli florets and, and things like this. And then he, he um, drains the noodles puts the noodles in a bowl, spoons some of the broth over the noodles, and then adds the, the greens to the top of this, and then some finely chopped green onions and microgreens on the top of the noodle bowl. And um, he knows that's dad's favorite. And so every time we go there, they don't even bother to ask anymore what we want for dinner. It's, it's always the noodles. Yeah. And Craig makes them the same way all the time. And I, I can't quite get mine to turn out as good as he, he make, makes his. So I don't even try. I yeah, know, but last, last <laughs> night you watched carefully to I did. Pay, pay attention to the detail. Maybe so that's Craig, what that'd be great if Craig could come on the show and show us how to make it. Was yeah. there a birthday cake? Because it is a special day. Oh, well, actually, he didn't make the birthday cake. We, we, have a, um, we actually have here in Portland a, a vegan um bakery um which is called piece of cake and you go there and you can get any kind of birthday cake made vegan so it's it's not really healthy i mean it's got oil in it and things like that but um since we only have it a couple of times a year we figure and we have a little tiny piece we figure we can handle it so we had a carrot cake a naked carrot cake Please tell them it was no, naked. We had a cake. naked carrot cake, which okay. means it didn't have all this um, frosting all around the sides of it. And it was about this big. It was this little, little six inch cake. And we only ate half of it. And that, that's like what was- uh, <laughs> Well, there. six of us. Six of us. Ate, so. ate about half of it. So you can, you can tell how small our pieces were. Anyway- you know, it's, I, it's, I would have figured you a chocolate guy, Dr. McDougall. Yeah, well, I do. I like. You're right. You're absolutely right. But I like the carrot cake. It was good. Had lots of carrots and nuts in it, and uh, thank thank goodness that uh, we only have at least up here in Portland we only have uh, six birthdays a year. <laughs> if, we, if we count the rest of the family, then we have about fifteen birthdays a year. But you know, on birthdays you have birthday cake; it's a special occasion. The problem is, is that Americans, Europeans, you know, people who live in rich countries, they have a, they have a birthday party every night after dinner. And sometimes every every day after lunch they have a birthday party, and that's why they're sick. You know, they they instead of having rich foods on special occasions, it's a everyday thing. Three times three times a day. You know, people start out with Easter for breakfast, and then they go on to Thanksgiving and Christmas for lunch and dinner, and then they have a birthday party after each lunch and dinner. And what would you expect but for people to become ill with that kind of rich food eating? It's really that simple. And so what you do, well, if you're sick, as most people are, most people are ill. You know, we consider 80% of people are either overweight or obese. You know, half the people are pre-diabetic, 
10, 12, 15% are frankly diabetic. Uh, half have major artery disease, end up with strokes and heart attacks. So when I say everybody's sick eating the Western diet, I don't think I'm off base much. But initially what our patients have to do is they have to repent and decide that they're not gonna feast at all for a while. It usually takes about four months to get well. You know, sometimes they have extra weight to lose and then they lose it about 10, 12, 14 pounds a month. So they had to get down to trim body weight, but it, usually most of their problems are gone within four months. They start to get better in about four to seven days. And that's because you have to have four to seven days to clear the gut out, to get all the bad food out of the intestinal tract. Then they start to get better, the arthritis goes away, the blood pressure drops, the cholesterol drops. And, you know, it's quite quick, the body heals itself. And by four months, pretty much everybody's cured of all the problems they're gonna get cured of. You know, the body heals very rapidly. Um, if you've ever had the experience of somebody who's gotten in a, uh, an accident, you know, say a bicycle accident or a motorcycle accident, they've broken legs and arms and ribs and collarbones and heads and got lacerations all over the place. Even with that kind of massive injury, they're in a wheelchair in about a week and they're up on crutches within three weeks and within about three months, they're back on their motorcycle or their bike. <laughs> And hopefully they won't re-injure themselves and you know, they, they continue to be healthy, but it doesn't take long. And I would offer you this as a, a birthday message from me to you, is that any, any program that's being sold to you that seems worthwhile testing, you know, it's not gonna kill you. You know, it's reasonable in terms of money, time and effort for you to test, they give it a test. And I assure you, if it works, it'll work immediately. And certainly within four months, it'll work. And by that time, you ought to abandon whoever's teaching you. And I, I would offer you that challenge for our work. We have published scientific data that shows how quickly people get well. And probably more importantly is we have published scientific data that shows that people make permanent changes. Our compliance rate for a year is 85% of people. That's what Oregon Health and Science University, what they observed, when they looked at our patient population, it's 85% of people are compliant with the McDougal diet for a year, which well, means they're permanently. But that's only after they have learned it from us. Yeah, that's, you have because to learn it right. We, we have a lot of people that come through our telemedicine program and they tell us, well, I've been doing the program for a couple of months now and I just can't seem to get it right. For 10 years. <laughs> So they're, they're, they don't quite get all the fine points. Yeah. And so then they come to us and then the, by the time they leave, they say, oh, well, now I understand what I was doing wrong and now I'll be fine. Yeah. So if you read it and you try it yourself and it doesn't quite work for you, then come to our telemedicine program and we'll teach you how to do it right. And yeah. then you won't have any problems. They're very inexpensively, very uh, time efficient. We're running a program right now. We've got uh, about 40, 45 people in this program. It started on Friday night and here it is Tuesday. And I tell people when they enter the program on Friday night, I said, by Tuesday, you'll have it. You know, by Tuesday, Dr. Lim has gotten pretty much everybody off their medications. Uh, we're able to get 90% uh, of people. This is what our studies show. 90% of people to reduce or stop their medications particularly their blood pressure and diabetic medications. So by Tuesday, they're off the drugs. And uh, by Tuesday, they, they love the food. They've had a tremendous amount of help from our support specialist who spend the day with them. And uh, they have their questions answered. They're off their medication. They're off their insulin and diabetic pills if, if they're able to get off. And as I say, nearly 90% of people are able to get off. And these are type two diabetics, of course. So anyway, it doesn't take long out uh, here. What we're talking about is four days. Let's see, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, two, four days, four days. You know, you, it's amazing what happens when you start taking care of this phenomenal thing called the human body. Your body is always healing, folks. It, it's just that you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta back off on the damage. You know, the healing processes aren't able to keep up with the damage caused by the fork and spoon. Or maybe the cigarettes or maybe the alcohol or whatever. You stop the damage and then you recover. It's that simple. The miracles in your body. And that's enough pep talk there for my birthday. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Mary, are you making another special meal today for his actual birthday? No, you know what? I, I just asked him while we were waiting to start this, what he wanted for his birthday dinner tonight. And he said, baked potatoes with uh, mango salsa. And so that's what he requested. And for a, a little, little boiled broccoli. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll put some broccoli. Yeah, but, and, and I have a choice, so. He no. could ask me for, you know. But, uh, but that's what I want to have for dinner tonight. And that's what I enjoy <laughs> most. And we have a big day today. On it. We started out this morning with Mary and I do a talk, a fireside chat with the group every morning that they're in the 12 day telemedicine program. And then I have this opportunity to spend time with you today, AJ, your group. And at three o'clock, I'll be giving the lecture on obesity and the lecture on diabetes. Lectures I've given to your group. And uh, I, I will share this with, with them. And I'll probably get done about five o'clock and I'll look back at the day and I'll say, this is how, exactly how I want to spend my day. I love to work. And I really, really enjoy what I do. And so for every birthday, I, I try and plan it so I work hard all day long. And that, that's what I do for half the birthday work. <laughs> do you, you, you have so many wonderful talks you've given over the years. Is there one that's just your favorite that you just never mind giving again and again? Uh, all of them I feel that way about. It's kind of like your children. You know, you love each and every one of them in a different way, but no, not really. I, I have a series of lectures and probably if you go look at our website and look at the internet, I, internet, I must have somewhere about 70, 80 different lectures that I've given. Uh, we're putting together a series now, which I have shared with you. I, I um, put together a series where the, the topic is uh, what, I'd, what I'd like to be able to tell you if I was your doctor. These are the things your doctor should tell you about high blood pressure, heart disease, heart surgery, uh, breast cancer, diabetes, obesity, autoimmune diseases. These are things I've shared with your audience. And I put it together now. I'm putting together two series of lectures that I, I'll only be talking about a bit on your, on your uh, presentations that you give. But there'll be uh, programs that we intensively uh, monitor and help people with. The one I put together is on anti-aging. We'll talk a little bit about that this morning. And the other one I put together, and I've got a bit of work, more work to do on that one. The anti-aging talk is all done. And that'll be packaged and we'll let you know about it because, because you'll find it of great value. Now, the, the second one that I'm working on now is on uh, postmenopausal women. And this is dedicated to women who are in their postmenopausal years, the things that they are most concerned about, like hormone replacement therapy, menopause, a bone mineral density tests, osteoporosis, uh, uterine cancer, breast cancer. Now, th this is fully dedicated, this series of, uh, of talks is fully dedicated to women in that particular age group. And then after I finish that, I'll put, put it together a series on premenopausal women and the things that you'll be more, most interested in. These will be things like pregnancy and children. And, you know, uh, we'll talk a bit about, uh, about the various kinds of cancers, uh, heart disease, cholesterol, and so on. But again, those are, those are topics that we cover thoroughly in the postmenopausal section also. You know. So this is, is, this is stuff that he wants everybody to know after he's gone. Come on, I'm sticking around. <laughs> I, I figure, you know, eventually I, I'm, I'm going to be in a situation as it happens naturally where I will not be able to provide this information. I've worked really hard. You know, I've worked really hard for the last 50 years learning things. You, and those of you who know me, you know, know my passion, my passion uh, to develop a story that's not only true, but uh, one that is effective in helping you get well. And so, yes, I'm putting it together. You're right, Mary. I'm putting it together as a series that will outlast us. And uh, you, you got to figure uh, you're 76, I'm 75. How much longer can we're we- We're not going to be here forever. <laughs> how much longer can we continue to have so much fun? Hey, I don't know. You know, Colin and Essie, they're in their, they're, they're pushing 90. They're doing really well. They are, they are. And they're great examples, uh, both of them, of what, what you can get out of life. But you know what? They took better care of themselves than I did. <laughs> Yeah, up until, you know, I think I started telling you that story up until I was uh, 
up until I became a sugar plantation doctor and learned the things that I learned, I was on a self-destruct, you know, had a stroke, was 90 pounds heavier than I am now, really sick young man. And uh, Mary and I, we were fortunate enough to learn some things that I've continued to try and teach you. Things that cost you nothing, always work. Basic stuff like it's the food. It is the food, food, you fix the food and you fixed over 90% of your troubles. Just all you gotta do is eat, eat what human beings are designed to eat. You, I know you've heard this, this speech before, but the human being is a starch eater, a starchitarian, you know, starch of war. Uh, 90% of your food intake needs to be potatoes, sweet potatoes, rice, corn, beans, peas, lentils, pastas, breads, you know, things you love. You love these things. It's just you've been misguided, you've been lied to, you know, by the meat industry and the dairy industry. And they, they, in order to sell their products, they've got to get you educated to think that you need protein and calcium. Even though there's never been a case ever of protein or calcium deficiency, you've got to worry about calcium and protein. So because of the big lies to make big money, I was condemned once to poor health and many of you still are, but you know, the truth's the truth. You know this, you know what I'm talking about is true because you're educated people. You, you learn from history, you learn from geography. You know that all large successful populations of people throughout all of verifiable history have retained the bulk of their calories from starch. You know, the Aztecs and the Mayans were known as the people of the corn. You think of Asia, and still you think of people that are rice eaters. 90% of their diet before 1980 was rice. You know, the Incas lived on potatoes. The Native American, who are, you know, the true original owners of our country, their diet was potatoes. And also, we have something called the Three Sisters, which is the Native American diet, which is corn, beans, and squash, the Three Sisters. This, this idea of uh, you need protein and calcium is just, just a way of selling meat and dairy. And you've been lied to, and you, know, you can straighten that out. You can get the truth. And as I told you just a minute ago, once you understand the truth and you apply it, you'll get better very quickly. In four to seven days, you'll start to get better. Within four months, everything that's gonna be fixed will be fixed, which is about 90% of your troubles. It cost you nothing, no adverse effects. Actually, it'll cut your food bill by as much as 80%. Good, to, good for the planet, good for the animals. Everything's positive about eating the right kind of food and taking good care of yourself. Well, I've been so lucky, AJ, I tell you, to, to have such a simple message that's benefited so many people over the years. You know, I'm the luckiest doctor in the world. My patients get well. They don't get a bunch of excuses and a handful of pills, they get well. And I know there are a lot of your listeners out there that have had the opportunity to to follow what Mary and I learned. And yeah, the exceptions are, are rare uh, that you didn't get exactly what we told you to get or you expected to get. You know, there are exceptions, of course, but they're, uh, they're rare because uh, the principles are so solid. You know, the comparison I give is uh, how many people do you know that have been heavy smokers who quit smoking who didn't get healthier or hardcore drunks who gave up the booze? I mean, how many of you know that didn't get well? The answer is none. Same thing with the food, if you're being poisoned by the rich Western diet, the body's gonna heal itself once you figure out how to stop the poisoning. Once you figure out that you need to eat a starch-based diet. It's, it's no more complicated than that. Anyway, you had some things you wanna talk about today, AJ. <laughs> Yeah, you know, so so of course, anytime you're on, the, the audience doesn't always know the topic in advance, so they send in lots of general questions if you'd oh, like, like to address some of those. But also, I sent you a couple of articles from the medical research because... Th- we're not, probably not going to change the minds of the people that believe that keto and carnivore are healthy or that lectins are unhealthy. But in the vegan community, there seems to be growing dissension about oils in general, omega-3 in particular. And so I sent you a couple of articles about that because people are still so concerned that if they don't right. take a, a DHA supplement, they're going to get dementia later in life or Alzheimer's. 
And, you know, lots of the younger doctors and nutritionists are basically saying oil is good. And I don't understand that even if it's good, it's so calorically dense. Who are these people that are eating oil? I, yeah. I just can't figure it out. They're steak oil salespeople. That's what they do. You'll find most of them are selling supplements. So they have a reason for giving you that kind of message, but it's not true. It's not, not true. I mean, you do require essential fats, but essential fats are made by plants, all essential fats. Only, only plants have the ability to desaturate at the carbon three and carbon six position. So we have omega three and omega six fats, which are our essential fats. And uh, the idea that you need to have extra uh, DHA or EPA to be healthy, to avoid uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease, it's nonsense. You, you know it's nonsense because there have been populations of billions of people who have been terrestrial. Uh, they have been landlocked in the sense that they had no access to these concentrated fish oils. They didn't live by the ocean. And yet, you know, they developed societies and brains and didn't get Alzheimer's and et cetera. So, I mean, you know that just from your own observations that well, this is just silly. Now you do need these essential fats, but as I mentioned, they come from plants. And the, the excuse that uh, I hear from these snake oil sales people is they tell you that the human body is not able to efficiently convert uh, alpha linoleic acid, ALA, into EPA or DHA. Nonsense. The human being does that very efficiently. And then, you know, when you look at the, the research, uh, AJ is, and I, I've done this for you because I, I know this challenges a lot of your listeners. And I actually sent you a couple of papers. And this was just for you know, about five minutes of research initially. You know, I, I made sure that there, the, uh, the other research agreed with what I had to say. But within the first five minutes of just going to uh, the internet and putting in the topic, you know, DHA uh, and Alzheimer's or DHA and dementia, you know, once you get past the snake oil salespeople, the ones that benefit, profit from selling these supplements, then you find articles like I sent you. I don't know whether we can tune into a couple of these. If we can, I will. I'll show you. In fact, uh, I did this for your listening audience so that they stop being fooled. And don't let them kid you. It took him a lot longer than five minutes. Right. And, and I, have them, I have them pulled up on my screen and I can oh, share ahead. the links with no, the audience. Go ahead and show them if you want. If you want. Uh, let, let's see. I, ha I actually have the, um, anyway, why don't you go ahead and show them and, I, and uh, okay. just look at the titles of the articles if you'd like to show them. All right. Let me, let me screen share. I'm not. And, and you, and folks, the idea is, is that you need these articles. You, you need to get them from AJ, from Chef AJ. Here one, uh, why have the benefits of DHA not been borne out in the treatment and prevention of Alzheimer's disease? How clear can it be? Look at the title of the article. They spend uh, like 20 pages telling you that there is, there's no evidence that DHA prevents dementia or Alzheimer's disease. You know, they've done, they've tried to do randomized controlled trials to prove the benefits that you're being lied to about. And they failed over and over and over again. Here's the article. There's another one. Put the other one up. The other one is here, this one. Well, I like this. Okay, let's read the, the effect of icosapentaenoic acid and uh, docosahexaenoic acid uh, supplementation to control cognitive decline and dementia and Alzheimer's. A systemic review and DHA supplementation did not, okay, you read down there in the conclusion, did not affect uh, whatever it says, you can read it. It doesn't work. <laughs> you know, I mean, good grief. These are big review articles that looked at the, at the science out there for, for you know, the, all the science. And of course, you'll find these uh, review articles are not funded by the supplement industry. So, so that's the, the difference is that the articles that say that it works yeah. is, are funded by the you got supplement it. industry. You got it. The, the, the industry has discovered that the way to sell people is to hire scientists and to use the proper methodology to get the results that you want. And, and these two review papers, which I hope you download from, from Chef AJ, and you try and find something that's, that contests this, that's, that's not heavily biased, you won't. 
<laughs> these are these are great review papers. So anybody who pre preaches the nonsense that you're going to be demented or develop Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common cause of dementia, they're lying to you. I can't say it any other way. They're lying to you. Why? Well, they sell supplements. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe they want to have some unique, unique part of their dietary lifestyle program. And oh my goodness, it happens to make them enough money to buy a Tesla. Well, I remember Mine. you had a discussion a, a couple of months ago on um, a program with a doctor, and he was promoting oh, yeah. um, this, uh, these um, that you had to have these um, fatty acids in order to be healthy. Selling and, salmon. Yeah, all right. He was selling salmon. Yeah. And yeah. and John kept asking him, "Do you sell supplements in your office?" And he refused to answer the question. Well, he, he finally did. He finally did, and he finally yeah. admitted that he did. Well, I got very upset with him because he was telling people to eat salmon. You know, kill enough fish have died from this these lies. And th and then he said, then somebody asked him, "Would you define what obesity is?" <laughs> And he started talking about uh, about uh, BMI and all kinds of things. And I just said, you heard it. You were there. You listened to it, AJ. You know what I'm talking about. I said to him, well, one way to define obesity is to take off your clothes and look in the mirror. Take off your clothes and look in the mirror. You want to define obesity <laughs> because the speaker was generous in his body fat. There was no doubt in my mind that he believed in eating fats. The fat you eat, the fat you wear. Yeah, I know I'm not kind. I'm not politically <laughs> correct, but you know. But you know he's not going to change. Him. And now that he's 75, I don't have to change. You don't have to change. No, I now they can just they, they can just write you off as a crushed the old man. Well, they've got look. You could you, you could you listen to what I have to say, and you find uh, other people contesting what I have to say, and you know they're they're, they're well-meaning people, they're well-educated people. You just say, well, you know, Doctor McDougal, he's old. Plus, he had a stroke when he was 18. Why don't you prove he's wrong? Come on. Here, here, <laughs> you, you know, you, you, you're, he's, you're fighting him. He's got one glove off. He's demented. D don't you want to contest with him? Uh, and they're uh, always sorry when they do. Uh, well, let's just say I do my homework. <laughs> and Mary's right. You know, before I, even though I found those two articles within five minutes, and you will too, you know, I made sure that I didn't miss much. Put the work into it. You, you want to have any doubt as to how hard I work when people contest with me? <laughs> you go to YouTube and you put in uh, Dr. Michael Greger and Dr. John McDougal. And you'll see some interesting discussions there. About the potato. About the potato. You know what, Dr. Michael Greger, I don't think will ever contest with me again. And believe me, if you want to contest, you want to, you want to argue, and my patient's health is at stake. I'll put the work in and likely you're going to have a pretty tough time because I ain't all that demented. <laughs> <laughs> you don't seem so at all. Did you, did you happen to ever meet Dr. Ellsworth Wareham? He lived to, I believe, 105 or 106. I, I, I actually, I didn't know him, but I knew about him as an Adventist. He was sharp as a tack. I don't know. I don't think he took any DHA, but I had him on my show and when he was like 103 and he was yeah. he, the only thing he stopped, I think like like at about 102, he stopped driving and at like 97, he stopped working because he yeah. was doing surgery and his wife wanted to spend more time with him. <laughs> well, there are exceptions out there and we all want to use them as uh, as ideal people and emulate their good behaviors. But by and large, most of these people are what we what we consider moderate people. Uh, they, they just do a little bit. I'm not a moderate person, okay? I, I got a type AAA personality. I do everything with enthusiasm. And uh, I got myself into big trouble. I, I told you a few minutes ago I, that I had a stroke at 18 and I was 90 pounds heavier than I am now. I had all kinds of health problems because I ate the rich American diet with enthusiasm. Well, I had, a, I had an interesting conversation with my great grandmother. My great grandmother who uh, lived to be 106. But when she was about 103, uh, we had an interesting conversation. Uh, let's, let's go back a little further than that. Uh, back when I was a young boy, my, she would say to my, my sister Kay and, and to me, you guys eat too much meat, it's gonna make you unhealthy. 
And here she's, she's 103 and I'd become a vegan. I didn't eat any animal products at all. And uh, she asked me, she asked me if I'd go out and get her a hamburger. And I knew exactly what she wanted me to do. She wanted me to go get a hamburger that was wrapped in a yellow paper that had uh, airy white bread buns and a wafer thin piece of beef and two pickles and mustard and, and ketchup. And, and I took this little hamburger home to her and, and I cut it in and, and she opened it up and she cut it into quarters. And then she took a quarter of that burger and she shook it in my face and she said, if you'd eat a little more meat, you'd be healthier. And then she proceeded to eat two quarters and she put the rest away for later. But you know, at that same restaurant, I ordered two double cheeseburgers, you know, a couple of milkshakes and a <laughs> big order of fries. I don't do that. I don't do moderation. So what I've had to discover is that what I do is I turn my enthusiasm positively because I'm not gonna change my personality. And uh, I very enthusiastically do good things. Like tonight, he won't eat just one baked potato. He'll probably eat three. Yeah, well, they're really good. I mean, potatoes <laughs> are so satisfying. But anyway, get, get, go, ahead, go ahead, AJ. I, just, I was just wondering if you guys ever had a Wendy's baked potato, because when I'm out and about, they're a lifesaver. And I don't know, how, Mary, how did Wendy's make them so fluffy? Well, you know, what, what I have learned, AJ, is that <clears throat> if you take russet potatoes and you scrub them really well and you bake them at 425 degrees, um, for about an hour, the insides get fluffy and the outsides get kind of crispy. And so um, the fluffy, the, it takes that high heat to get the insides fluffy. So I'm sure that's what they do there. Uh, they're, they're just, they're so good. I mean, I, yeah. I like when I'm- It's been a long time, but we have had them in the past. Yep. That's neat. What question, Dr. McDougall, do you get asked most often? And do you ever get annoyed having to keep answering it? Well, I don't, I don't know. I, I, never, I don't think I ever get annoyed at people's questions. Uh, just like I never get tired mm -hmm. of giving the same talks. You know, everybody's different. And if you're going to interact with them, the, the conversation is always fresh. So I... I think probably you get asked the most about the fake meat products. Yeah. It depends on the audience I'm talking to, sure. You know, I, there, there are a lot of people out there that have no understanding about what a healthy diet is, and they're very defensive about their own eating plan. And they'll start with the, the ideas about well, where you're gonna get your calcium, where you're gonna get your protein, et cetera. You all know the answer to that. There's never been a case of calcium or protein deficiency ever reported, you can't miss. I guess these days, the other thing is, is people ask about omega-3 fats. Yeah. You, you don't eat fish or you don't eat flax. They go, oh, where do you get the omega-3 fats? As, as I told you, the only plants can make omega-3 fats. Okay, no animal can do that. No fish can do that. And, and the, the way the fish get the omega-3 fats is they eat seaweed or algae and they store it in their bodies. That's what they do. They don't make it. So what I would encourage you to do is to go to the original source, go to the plants. You can't miss. You, you can't miss. Don't be threatened by the idea that you're going to become demented. Worse yet, Alzheimer's disease, which is accounts for about 90% of dementia. You want, you want to know what causes Alzheimer's disease, AJ? I know you do. I do. I know you do. So, you know, this, this is going to be part of the aging lecture that uh, I'm putting together and we're going to be promoting it to people is a discussion of how you get Alzheimer's. And uh, you get Alzheimer's from aluminum poisoning. Okay, that's what it is. It's aluminum poisoning. Aluminum is not a nutrient. You don't have to consume aluminum. And we've known that aluminum is uh, toxic and cause neurologic problems. We've known it for at least 80 years. Uh, we used to feed uh, aluminum hydroxide to our, uh, our kidney dialysis patient. They'd become demented. They developed lesions that were typical of Alzheimer's disease from aluminum. Why would you feed that to them? Because it did because something. It, you know, the, the aluminum hydroxide took care of the phosphorus that was in the diet. Oh, okay. So anyway, and that's part of the dialysis regime. But, and, but anyways, the way, it, the way it started out is uh, 
uh, Louis Alzheimer. He, he found the first case of Alzheimer's disease in about 1907. And, and uh, he, he went to the autopsy lab and he noticed that they had a typical lesion in the brain. They had what we call neurofibril tangles and senile plaques. He had to use his microscope to see them. But he noticed this back, you know, when he first discovered the first case of Alzheimer's. And subsequently, over the next few years, they found 33 cases of Alzheimer's disease. But you can't find this until after they're dead. That's right. You've got to be dead. You do an autopsy. <laughs> but anyway, anyway uh, of course, there's, there's millions of cases of Alzheimer's disease in the world today. And it's gone from that level. What, what they discovered next was, uh, you know, after Louis Alz uh, Alzheimer made this observation in his first patient who died of Alzheimer's, uh, what they did is they noted that people who drank well waters, you know, their, their source of water was highly contaminated with aluminum, had very high rates of Alzheimer's. And uh, then they came to the conclusion, just like Louis Alzheimer did, that, you know, doctors agreed that unless you see these neurofibril tangles and these senile plaques, which you see under a microscope, then you, you don't have Alzheimer's disease. It's called a pathognomonic lesion which means that if you see the pathology, you see the neurofibril tangles and the senile plaques, you name the disease, you got it. And uh, the next step was they used uh, uh, electron microscopes and they dissected these senile plaques. And what they found is they had a central core of aluminum silicate, okay? So to have the senile plaques, you have to have the aluminum silicate. To have Alzheimer's, you gotta have the senile plaques and the neurofibro tangles. Anyway, you, you can carry that discussion further as I do in this course that we're put, uh, I've already put together. We're gonna to be promoting it to you. <clears throat> it talks about treatments and one of the treatments that's successful for, for Alzheimer's is to give people desferoxamine, which is an aluminum chelator, which uh, removes aluminum from the body and the brain. It actually stops or slows the progression of people who have Alzheimer's. It's not popular, it's a generic drug. No money to be made, so it never became popular. Anyway, that, that's the story of Alzheimer's. Uh, the, the thing that you need to note is you can get exposed by, to aluminum through pots and pans and baking sodas. And you know, there's all kinds of dietary sources of aluminum, but <clears throat> the most, uh, the most uh, damaging source of aluminum is not through the gastrointestinal tract, it's through the nose. It used to be that people were exposed to aluminum by, uh, by occupations like brake linings, for example. Uh, they inhaled aluminum and what they found was these are the most severe cases of Alzheimer's. When, when present in a stalk of the brain, the olfactory lobe, lobe, you saw a density, a high density of these neurofibro tangles and senile plaques. So it was obvious that it, it entered the body in such a way that the worst cases are, are cases that you get to the nose. This should make you worry about something that you do every day. Most of you do, you do every day, you don't know it, what you're doing to yourself is you take, you spray aluminum chloride in your nose every morning when you spray your pits, your armpits with antiperspirants. All antiperspirants are aluminum chloride based. So, you know, you go and yeah. Anyway. Well, even if you roll it on, you probably, we still smell it. Well, yeah, you, you smell it plus it goes through the skin, but it's not as bad as stuff is stiffing no. it through your nose. Now, it doesn't mean you, you can't use deodorants. You can use deodorants. You can't use antiperspirants. Anyway, that's the story on the Alzheimer's is due to aluminum poisoning and uh, you could take action. Nobody's gonna say anything. In fact, the, the fluoride and aluminum industries are very upset about this story, which you know, I've been telling for 50 years and you know, Louis Alzheimer, he, no, he didn't know, but <laughs> he might've known. I think he died, uh, I think in the late forties. Any, anyway, uh, now you know, and now you can take action. You can stop using the antiperspirants. You can make sure your pots and pans aren't aluminum based, or at least they're covered up with so you don't you don't uh, touch your food to the aluminum. And, and I I use aluminum foil still to to cover things and stuff, but I always use parchment paper. Um, 
again with the aluminum foil so the food touches the parchment paper and not the foil. Dr. McDougall, you recently gave a talk about attractiveness. And so you mentioned why it is people smell. So if we're eating this diet, like I don't get why people use perfume and deodorant. What are they trying to cover up or mouthwash? They're trying to cover up the smell of dead animals. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a talk that I gave for your group about four months ago or so. And they can, you can find that on the internet. It's about attractiveness and you smell like what you eat. And in particular, the sulfur that's in the food. Uh, sulfur stinks. You know that, you know, rotten eggs stink. Very offensive odor. You know, when you go to uh, Yosemite Park and you get near the sulfur pits, that's a repulsive odor. So sulfur stinks. You have to ask yourself, where do you get the sulfur from? It's the food. In fact, if you go to a dentist and you complain about bad breath, the dentist will check your breath with something called a hal meter. And what it does is it measures the amount of sulfur in your breath. There's even mouthwashes which uh, complex the sulfur They're called smart mouthwashes. And they claim this mouthwash, they claim all bad breath is due to sulfur. Um, you know, I think a lot of bad breath is due to sulfur. So how do you get the sulfur? Well, you get it from the food. If you take a look at uh, beans compared to beef, same amount of calories, same amount of protein, you have four times as much sulfur in beef as you have in beans. You compare uh, rice to chicken, you got seven times as much sulfur in chicken. You compare tuna fish to sweet potatoes, you've got 12 times as much sulfur in tuna fish. So <clears throat> what you do is you, you know that the, the foods that stink are the animal foods. And not only does it stink uh, as far as your breath goes, you can't get rid of it by just using mouthwashes. What happens is sulfur is eaten, goes through the intestinal tract, is absorbed as hydrogen sulfide, and it goes into the bloodstream. And in the bloodstream, it circulates until it gets to the lungs. And even if you brush your teeth real thoroughly, well, each breath you, you exhale, you exhale large amounts of sulfur, okay? The, the sulfur goes to your body, to the skin, and comes out in the pers perspiration. And uh, as a result, you get body odor. The, the sulfur goes uh, through the intestinal tract and ends up in your bowel gas. Yeah, we make a lot of bowel gas eating our kind of diet. <laughs> it's because it's natural and normal. But our gas smells good, better. <laughs> their, their gas smells like something died. You remember those old days, you know, when we used to laugh about it in the elevator? So anyway, you're tired of stinking, which is very important because attractiveness has to do with smell. You fall in love because of odor, not because of sight, but because of odor. The, the perfume industry knows this. They sell you expensive perfumes to cover up your body odor. It, it really has never accomplished to, to any success. You've got you to stop the bad odor. You've got to smell like somebody, you've got to stop smelling like somebody who's sick. That, that's, what the, that's what the sulfur does. It conveys a message of illness. And you don't want to be associated with ill people. You, you, you know, you, you, when you reproduce, for example, and you, you're mating a man and woman to produce an offspring, you want to produce the best offspring possible. And one of the clues to finding a healthy mate with healthy sperm or healthy eggs is by odor. And it conveys to the person that you're dealing with to produce this offspring, you're dealing with a healthy person. And it's not just reproductive issues we're talking about. We're talking about, <clears throat> about in your business, in your workplace, in your schools, you know, whether or not you uh, get promotions with, with the salary you make, salary you make uh, depends upon whether you're healthy or not. People who are overweight or diabetic, uh, they, they, have a decrease in the amount of wages that they get. And they're less likely to be hired. They're less likely to be accepted into a college. And if they're in school, they get poorer grades uh, because of the body odor, the stink. We naturally want to be around healthy people and the clues to health are odor and sight. It's all natural folks. This is you know, something that has to do with survival of the species. Anyway, that's what you wanted to hear, oh, didn't you, AJ? <laughs> Great. But I, gave, I gave a very extensive lecture on this with 
you know, you can read all the scientific research. I always put the the research, the studies down in the right-hand corner of the slide. So if you're interested, you can look it up. You can see whether or not I'm exaggerating, whether you can see whether or not I'm telling you the truth. You can learn more. And most of you will. You want to know. You want to know how to stay healthy, how to live long, how to have a high quality of life. And you do that with the right kind of information, and you don't get that information from industry. They're they're out to sell products. Yep. Hey, here's a funny comment from Stephen, who's watching live. Good to see you again, Stephen. He goes, "I'm more concerned with heart disease than fart disease." Yeah. <laughs> well, but I, I gave a whole lecture to your group on heart disease. What causes it? Why heart surgery, both bypass surgery and angioplasty, do not save lives. I explained to you exactly why. I talked to you about rupture of plaques, which cause heart attacks. So it's not not the old disease in your arteries that cause you to have heart attacks and strokes. It's the the um, the volatile fresh disease, and what happens is these pimples inside your arteries they pop, and they cause the blood to clot, and you have a heart attack or stroke. And uh, unfortunately, our surgeries just can't take care of that kind of mechanism. And that's why, you know, the studies are absolutely consistent that heart surgery does not save lives. Yet people continue to buy into it. Why? Because it's business. They, they, uh, and their doctor says it'll work. Well, you know what? That's, <laughs> they're part of the business. They yeah. make money. Yeah. So these are expensive procedures. They cost thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars, heart surgeries do. Potatoes cost nothing. Yeah. Why would I sell you potatoes if I'm interested in making money? Yeah. Mm. Colonoscopies make a lot of money too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did I give you that lecture? I haven't given you that lecture yet. Yeah. Oh, no. We're, oh, I'm, I can't wait for your GI lecture because I love, I love that book well, with all the pictures. You know, I, I, have a, I have a new lecture out, uh, which again, we'll present to you as part, of, uh, as part of the series we're doing on postmenopausal women and premenopausal women. Oh, but you have a great GI lecture too that you could do for AJ. I've actually I've done it for her one time. Oh, really? But yes, you I did. Did. I think you did it for the summit, but I don't think you did it for the the regular show that everybody right. has access to. So well, that I, would be really I'd be fun happy to do that sometime. Trying to schedule it. That's a, that's a really it. fun lecture. It's, it uh, really is. So here's some here's a kind of a, an interesting question from Gunther who says congratulations on your 75th birthday. Yeah. He says, can you please ask Dr. McDougall what other potatoes can improve your eyesight? My grocery store in my area don't carry white potatoes. I heard him say white potatoes can improve a person's eyesight, but they only carry Yukon gold, red potatoes, and russets. Well, they're full of. Uh, oh, those are all white potatoes. Yeah, and they're <laughs> they're full of uh, of lectins. Excuse me, lutein, lutein, and the other precursors that prevent macular degeneration. Uh, white potatoes are loaded with uh, lutein and and other other precursors that that populate the uh, the the uh, ocular nerve and keep the macula healthy and prevent macular degeneration, which is the, one of the most common causes of blindness as people get older. They develop macular degeneration. So you, you can't miss. You know what? The system is designed so well that you can't miss. You know, it, it's, if you eat a starch-based diet, it has all the protein and essential fats and carbohydrates and fibers and phytonutrients all present in the basic starches. The exception is, is that if you eat starch, starches that are grown above the ground, but like grains and legumes, you have to add a little bit of vitamin A and vitamin C in the form of broccoli or a slice of orange. And, but underground storage organs are, <clears throat> are complete. They have everything you need, except V12, which we're not gonna talk about. But um, yeah, the human being would not have been on this planet for you know, 750,000 years the humanoid would not have been on this planet for two and a half million years <clears throat> if, if we required a dietetic handbook to stay alive or a dietitian to follow us around to stay alive. It, it had to be a relationship of hunger with food. And if you satisfy hunger, you had to get everything you need to stay alive. Otherwise, the system would not have worked. You'd have died out as a species. Isn't nature kind? Oh my goodness, what a wonderful, wonderful 
planet we live on and what a wonderful system and we're so lucky. But unfortunately you get, uh, you get bad information and that's information that's designed to make somebody rich. It's called greed. <laughs> Anyway, I don't want to get into any moral issues unless you want to. <laughs> nice. So some of the questions people are sending me, they're highly medical. So feel free to not answer them. And I'm telling people to take the program, you know, that you, you're, you're in the middle of one right now, but I believe you have another one in July coming up. Oh, well, hopefully, I think we're going to run one in, May, in June. Okay. Well, right now on your website, it says July, but. Well, July, it's probably so, July. Yeah. It's probably July. The, the website is accurate. Usually okay. every other month. And I'd encourage you to sign up early because the, the programs sell out. But people can only get a consultation with like Dr. Lim if they're in the program. Is that correct? The way, the way it works is this. They, uh, we, we run a special consultation of pe for people who aren't sure that they want to join the program. And you're charged for the consultation with Dr. Lim. And if you decide to go to the program, then that charge is rolled over into the program. Because part of uh, the program is medical care. And uh, Dr. Glenn sees the patients initially, and then I see some of the more difficult ones. And uh, that's all included. So um, you can get an appointment. I encourage you, if you have any question about whether or not you want to go to the program, you know, call the 800 number, 941-7111, or send us an email at office at drmcdougall.com. And we'll set up an appointment with you and Dr. Lim and it'll cost you. But as I say, it rolls over into the, into the program if you take the program. But uh, <clears throat> I, I have a, a patient that if, if July is the next program that we're running, I had a patient contact me this morning who has a, uh, only 10% only of their kidney function left. And uh, this patient really can't wait till July. They've got to get, get the dietary issues started like right now. So the way we're going to handle it is uh, uh, Carol will call the person up or email the person and get them signed up for the July program. And Dr. Lim and I will start working with them immediately uh, with the idea that they're going to take the program because you, you really, you know, having a medical evaluation and the care we put in, reducing, starting new medications, whatever seems to be appropriate, you know, it, it, you, you have to... You have to have more than that. You have to follow up with learning what you're supposed to do. That's the hardest part for some people. Yeah. The first book we wrote is called Making the Change. You know, we, Mary and I put this book together back in the, in the late 70s. It was called Making the Change. It wasn't called Heal and Stay Healthy. Because we knew the problem back then as it is now is to get people to change, permanently to change. And we've, I, we've been working on that for the last 50 years. You know, I've run live-in programs. Uh, we uh, have done adventure trips where we've taken people all over the world on these amazing vacations. I've given lots of uh, lectures around the world and we've run weekend, weekend seminars and written 13 national best-selling books and did monthly newsletters. And we used to have, we used to have over a hundred restaurants that had a McDougal menu that served McDougal food, a hundred restaurants north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And still, I, I would guess there's at least 40 restaurants, and this was 20 years ago, that still have a McDougal menu. If you come to the, to the North Bay, uh, you'll find easily Chinese restaurants, Mexican restaurants that have a McDougal menu right there on the wall. Why? Because it's been a big profit, big profit business for, for these restaurants here. They, they make inexpensive food for you that you really love and you're a return customer. So it's good for business to serve our meal plan. And uh, anyway, the, the point being is we've tried many, many ways, including lockup programs. The most successful thing that we've done is the telemedicine program. Uh, I think it would, well, we, I know because we've asked people who've been through the St. Helena Hospital program, which I ran for 16 years and the resort program that I ran in Santa Rosa for 18 years. We have people now who attend the telemedicine program and they do it because they really need to. Any of you folks out there that have been with us in the past on a, a trip or a program and, and you're not doing as well as you should or you just wanna have a great time, uh -huh. be, be with people that think like you do, then you should sign up for the telemedicine program that we run now. 
But anyway, when I the point being when I <clears throat> when I ask or another other members of the staff ask, oh well, look, you've taken both programs. You've taken the lockup program, where we incarcerate you for ten to twelve days. You've taken the program where we come into your home. You know where you where you start out in the beginning. You start out cooking the food. You know you you start dealing with problems uh, as to what what you're going to eat during the rest of the day in your own home. You know, what do they prefer? And without exception, the answer is I'd rather do the telemedicine program if I had a chance to do it again. Oh yeah, they miss the fact that uh, three times a day they'd go to a fancy dining room and somebody would wait on them and serve them <laughs> food. And they had a, a good chance to talk to other, other members of the program. That was always fun. They did that live, but you know, traveling all the way out to Santa Rosa, California was a real burden and very expensive. Being away from their family and their job was a real burden. Now we're able to do that in their own life setting. And all around the world, we have people from, from Sydney, Australia, and people from Berlin. And all over the world, we have people who attend because, because it's done over the internet and it's very flexible. You know, if, even if you're in a big, big, a big difference in time zones, uh, the program works for you. You know, our support specialists are there for you when you, when you're up and at them and helping you. And uh, most of the meetings are accessible in your time zone. And those that aren't, like the lecture I'm going to give this afternoon, you know, some people who are on the other side of the planet, uh, they they may be that might be sleeping time. Well, they're all recorded, and you uh, you just can listen to them then. So it fits in really well with people's lifestyle. The telemedicine program. I know without a doubt, if you ask any of our staff, you ask Doug Lyle or Jeff Novick, you, you ask them whether they would ever want to go back to a, uh, a live-in program, a residential program, they'll tell you no. In fact, they'd probably quit if we ever planned on doing that because they love so much being able to teach from their own home and the interaction, it's different, AJ. It's just like you and I talking right now, it's a kind of interaction that's different than us being in, you know, in person. And some of that difference is very positive. You know, we find the, the people are, are, are much closer to us in many ways and you know, they're in a more neutral territory and they feel more comfortable asking questions and you know, making sure that they get uh, exactly what they came to the program for. Well, and they get a chance to know us much better because we meet with them every morning. And then after they leave the program, we have meetings with them every other week for a year. Well, but actually, I think the support specialist sees them every yeah, week. Yeah, the, the support specialist yeah. does. But we, you and I, you and, I but, and Heather, see them every other week. Yeah. So there's, there's a, a big follow-up. There's at least a year follow-up for people. Anyway, that's, that's what we do now. And I certainly hope that we don't have to go back to a residential program, but you know, if, if it seems appropriate, we thought about running another adventure trip. You know, we took, we took thousands of people all over the, all over the world, you know, mostly in, in uh, Central America and South America and, and Hawaii, those kinds of trips. And we but, thought about having an advanced study weekend. Yeah, we thought about having a live advanced study weekend, but. The, you know, the world is, is so crazy right now. And, <laughs> you know, I'm sure in your community, you listen to the reports on one virus or another that's resurging. And I don't know. Let's, let's just say we're, we're really glad that we have the internet to continue our message. Nice. I think that's so great what you do. Let them have the consult with Dr. Lim and then have it be applied to the, the class, to the program if they take it. It's a great idea. So here's a question from Sheba, and it's, can a person figure out the contribution of blood pressure medication to dementia symptoms if there is one? Could low blood pressure overnight cause insufficient blood flow to the brain? No, I think that person wrote me this morning. Oh, okay. Yeah, Sheba. I, I, really, I really do, because I, I, I got that kind of question, you know, just after I got up this morning in my email box. But... Uh, look, these medications are dangerous. They all have adverse effects. So our goal is to get you off the drugs and they're going to decrease blood flow to the brain. 
they're associated with dementia, with, with uh, decreasing cognitive function. You know, and uh, whether one blood pressure medication is, is worse than another, well, there are some that are worse than others. Like for example, your calcium channel blockers, they're, they're associated with a, a high risk of suicide. There's some that you won't even, even well, consider. Calcium channel blockers are, okay. are some of those. Angiotensin receptor blockers, they increase the chance of you dying of heart disease. But when you lower the blood pressure artificially by taking drugs, you're gonna artificially decrease the perfusion pressure to the brain. The pressure is up for a reason. It's up because you've got a sick cardiovascular system. That's why it's up because you can't effect effectively pump blood throughout your body because it's all clogged up with fat and diseased arteries. And so to, uh, to get nutrients to your tissues, the, the heart has to compensate, the blood vessels have to compensate. So the pressure rises, it's supposed to go up. And when you artificially lower the pressure, you gotta be very careful. If you lower it too much, uh, it's called the U-shape or J-shape curve of mortality. You increase the risk of uh, heart attacks and death from heart disease by as much as four times. And you increase the risk of stroke, at least double the risk of stroke if you're too aggressive with your treatment with blood pressure medication. So you, you need to be real careful. You've got to have a really smart doctor who pays a lot of close attention to you. Or better yet, you can get off the darn drugs. Yeah, but you can't do it by yourself. Well, you can't. You can, you're not supposed to. No, but I mean. Many people do. I know people. I know listen, people listen. That, that do that, but I mean. It, we don't tell them to do that. You know, so, because you'd really get into trouble if you, uh, took, if you stopped by yourself. No. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> you know, yeah, you you can't. We you watch need you need, pretty carefully. You need to have medical supervision if you're going to manipulate your medication. You know, I would advise no other than for you to have competent healthcare providers supervising what's going on, so that the correct decisions can may be made about the medications. Like I said, you don't want to overtreat high blood pressure, and you know, there's certain levels of blood pressure you want to treat because there's an advantage to lowering certain levels of blood pressure. And they're quite high compared to what you think. And the same thing with diabetic medication. As I told you, we, 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 our, our research shows this uncontested that nearly 90% of people are able to reduce or stop their medications, particularly their blood pressure and their diabetic medications. So, you know, our intention is to get you off the drugs. Sick people take drugs. Healthy people don't. And, and if we have to use medications, then, you know, I, I might give you a prescription, but I always <laughs> give it with the, the concern that I hope I'm doing you more good than harm. Because these, the, all the medications have adverse effects. And I hope that, you know, six weeks or six months or six years from now, you and I will look back and say, I did you more good than harm, but I'm just guessing, just guessing that I'm doing you more good than harm. So remember, you said you were a good guesser. I'm a good guesser. I've been at this for a long time and I put my money in my guesses. They're pretty good. But you know, sometimes I'm wrong. Uh, fortunately, most of the time when I do make a mistake, I'm in a position where I can make another decision with you. And uh, I, I have to say it's been extremely rare when I've regretted what I've done to try and help people. Extremely rare. Dr. McDougall, is there something called negative three LDL cholesterol? Probably. I don't know. I don't know if I understand. You know, I, 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 I can't keep up with all the nonsense that goes on <laughs> with fractionating cholesterols and particle sizes and, you know, lipoprotein A's and B's and, oh, man. You know, I'm just a country doctor. Now, people love that stuff, though. So do laboratories. So do doctors. <laughs> they love all the little numbers they get yeah, to see. They love the numbers because, come on, doc, keep looking. There's got to be. There's got to be something you can test for that I won't have to give up my cheeseburgers. Come on, one more test that says it's okay for me to eat cheeseburgers. I just use total cholesterol. That tells me enough about your condition for me to make decisions. And the only decision I have to make, because you're going to follow the diet. You know, otherwise, you, why would you bother talking to me? And the diet is no cholesterol and dramatically drops blood cholesterol lower. Our results are within seven days, the average reduction in cholesterol is 22 milligrams per deciliter. 
Okay, and that's that's, that's in, average. That, that's in 1,703 yeah. people. So you're going to follow the diet. Uh, the question is whether or not I be more aggressive. And that's whether or not you take statin drugs. Well, the statin drugs are extremely low benefit. They're weak. It's very difficult to show an ultimate outcome of living longer and better by taking these drugs. You have to, you have to apply these medications to very sick people to see any statistical benefit. You'd be amazed. Well, you, maybe you wouldn't be amazed. Maybe you'd realize that by using these statin drugs, what you're doing is you're lowering cholesterol. You're not making the body healthier. You're not improving the condition of the arteries. All you do is are, oh, lower the cholesterol. The cholesterol is not the problem. Okay, I've never seen a patient die of high cholesterol ever in my whole career. The problem is that you're eating food. It happens to be high in cholesterol. You're eating food that makes the body sick. And one of the, one of the signs of the sickness is you have an elevated blood cholesterol. You have lots of signs. You have elevated uric acid, elevated blood pressure, elevated blood sugar, you get too much body fat. They all kind of go together. Yeah, it's, it's called food poisoning. <laughs> wow. Okay, because I, 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 I'm going to send an email to this lady asking her to consider having the consult with Dr. Lim and joining the program because she's asking about her husband who suffered a stroke and the left artery is 80%, 50%, and 90%. And that sounds pretty serious. Well, that, that's <laughs> why you have experts who weigh in on your problems. And Dr. Lim's a board certified family practitioner. I'm a board certified internist. But more than that, you know, we're passionate about, about our patients and about gaining the best knowledge we can to help you. And at least in my case, we're not, we're not ever put in a position where we feel that we're afraid to tell the truth. You know, that, that's, that's a problem with a lot of my colleagues is they're afraid to tell the truth, even though they might know it. They're afraid <laughs> of being criticized by their colleagues and much less, much more, they're afraid of being sued. You know, and I've been at this for 50 years. In 50 years, I've never had a lawsuit or a threat of a lawsuit. And I, I know that's largely because of good luck. I've only had one complaint against me in 50 years. Wasn't that the, wasn't that the widow of Dr. Atkins? It was Robert Atkins and Veronica Atkins. She filed suit, she tried to file a suit against me for HIPAA violation. She couldn't do that, didn't violate any HIPAA rules. She filed, finally filed on my Hawaii state license and she didn't file with the medical licensing board. She filed with some business board Sucker, she sicked her lawyers on me, <laughs> and she went on. She went on on Larry King show and called me a, a, a vegan Nazi. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I tried to make the lawsuit public because I wanted you to all see what was going on, and it pretty much disappeared. And I didn't find out about it until about four years later that uh, there was some success she had. Uh, not, not any big success, you know, nothing that really compromised me, but you know, that, that's the only complaint I've had in 50 years of practice. And I'm proud of that. I hope that I can continue that. But again, it's a lot of, it's just good luck. Most doctors have been sued. And if you're in gynecology and obstetrics, uh, you've been sued three, four, five Definitely. times. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think his wife's still alive. Veronica's probably still alive. I don't know. Uh, Robert Atkins was an adversary, and when he died, he was declared obese, had high blood pressure and uh, heart disease. So, you know, he, he lied, too. Uh, he lied about his health conditions. I happened to get his, uh, his angiograms. Uh, they were lost in the fire, so I can't show you them anymore. But uh, I got his angiograms, <laughs> and he went on Larry King and swore to Larry King that he had no artery disease. Well, you know, I had his angiograms. He had terrible artery disease and he died of heart failure. And he, you know, he, that's why he died. He didn't die because he fell. He, he died and then he fell. That's what happened. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's, a, that's a long story. And uh, yeah, one yeah. of great interest that allowed me to have an audience with uh, 
Neil Cavoto, I was on his show and I, I was on Deborah Norville's show and I got uh, columns in the front page of the New York Times. And so, you know, I got a chance to talk about Robert Atkins and what these lo low carb diets do for you. They kill you. They're dangerous. I, I can show you four, so four review papers. There are only four where they looked at low carb diets in relationship to your risk of dying and suffering from heart disease. And all four of them clearly condemn these low carb diets. The Atkins diet is increasing dramatically your risk of dying and having heart disease. I wouldn't say that if I couldn't back it up because they're very litigious people. Well, I, but nobody seems to believe it that they're still just as popular. Well, they yeah. are just as popular. What, what paleo? diets and yeah i mean that he died but the the dietary style lives on and yeah. thrives and, and what, what you know it makes things somewhat worse is there are vegan low carb diets come on now <laughs> you really got to manipulate the food and uh, ask a lot of the patient to get them to eat a a low carb vegan diet you know anyway it's just it's just unfortunately there's a sucker born every day and unfortunately, people are really desperate. They don't, they, they want to lose the weight. They want to have good health, but they just don't know how to do it. And unfortunately, the money's behind doing the wrong thing. You know, the expensive foods are the meats and the dairy and the eggs. And becoming more expensive every day due to inflation. You know that, you hear about it every night on the news. So that's where the money is in the food business. And then then you have uh, money that is made by hospitals and laboratories and doctors. You know, doctors don't make their money when you're well. They make the money when you're sick. It's, it's, it's a, a system where they're paid by, by doing things to you. That's how they make their money. And so even though the doctor may be well-intentioned, there are a lot of good doctors out there. I'm not trying to condemn the entire business. But as a business model, it's oriented to doing things to you. The hospitals don't keep their doors open unless you're sick. So the whole system is set up to make money. And as a result, uh, you are at the, you're at the end of this whole game and you suffer, you suffer terrible. You know, it's not like we're dealing with a broken television set. You know, what we're dealing with is your spouse, you know, your wife or husband. We're dealing with your mom or dad or your children. You, you would think there would be a higher moral ethic if we were dealing with a commodity like your family. There's not. It's just money. Great. Thanks. So speaking of telling the truth, Johanna writes, why do places like this send out information knowing it is wrong? And we're gonna to get to it in a minute. It's a study from Harvard, but first there is somebody that would like to wish you happy birthday. This is somebody whose life you greatly, greatly influenced. And I believe he became a lifestyle medicine doctor because of you. We're just oh, he's right. joining us now. He is a wonderful person that works with Dr. Wayne Dysinger at Lifestyle Medicine. His name is Dr. Ryan Herring and let's welcome him to the show. Hi, hello there. Hello, Dr. McDougall and, and Mary. Hi. Hi, it's so nice to, to be with you today. And so um, as, as Chef AJ was saying, um, so I'm a, a primary care and a lifestyle medicine doctor in Southern California. Um, I work with, with Dr. Wayne Dysinger, who's, who's Chef AJ's own personal lifestyle medicine doctor. So. <laughs> So it's, it's really a pleasure to be with you today. And, and Chef AJ had a wonderful idea. Uh, I was on her show last, last month talking about primary care and lifestyle medicine in, in younger generations. And so she encouraged me to come on the show today and, and share with you really about the influence and the impact you've had on my life, Dr. McDougall. So it's, it's really a a wonderful opportunity to be here with you on on your birthday. So first of all, happy birthday! Thank you. And I know it's a it must be a very special day for for you and, and for your family. Um, and I, I really like the shirt that you're wearing as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chef AJ. That's a wonderful shirt. When so, you're 75, I'll get you one too. You know, <laughs> okay. I, I I feel that you 
understand the great fortune of being a doctor that helps people. It's, it's a sad situation and, and you're probably observant enough to see how difficult it is to practice medicine with ineffective tools. You know, it's one drug after another, one side effect to treat or one drug to treat this side effect and that side effect. And patients never get better. It, it, it is horrible to practice that kind of medicine. If you're a general doctor, the exceptions being there are doctors like orthopedic surgeons and ophthalmologists who really do a lot of good for people because they've got some gimmicks that work that are, that are very beneficial. But to be a general doctor, a family practitioner, an internist, uh, a GP, even a gynecologist, uh, because people never get well. You can't get people to be well by giving them one drug after another. You may temporize a few situations. So I, you know, I just feel like you could, if you ha can't say it now, you can say it later, that you're the luckiest doctor in the world because your patients get well. Yes, that's absolutely true. And, and I really have you to thank Dr. McDougall because you were the, the first person that really opened up my eyes to this. And this goes all the way back to when I was in college, uh, even before medical school. I was getting ready to and I really wanted to get a bigger picture of our here. So I happened to humble your work and I was, man, it was like that went off. I knew right that that's the need to be. So we're, we're missing some of your valuable really, words. Ryan, Ryan, your, your audio is breaking up and I don't know why. You know. So I want to hear these things. I, I mean, it's my birthday. I want to... <laughs> I feel good already, but I want, I'd love to hear it better now. Keep talking. Can you say something, Dr. Herring? Oh, I hope you're not frozen. You can come yeah. in and out if you want. Gee whiz, that's really too, that, that's, uh, that's It's so a, yeah. the, the Technology gods have not smiled on us today. Yeah. <laughs> You know, maybe do a screen share, Dr. Herring. You had a picture with Dr. McDougall taken when he won the award from the, the, the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Oh, good. That's where you met him. Yeah, that was a, that was a great honor. There's only uh, four, four uh, lifestyle, life, Lifetime Achievement Awards ever given, and I got one of them. And uh, that was in... Oh, oh yeah. there. There you okay. go. It was in uh, 2019, October. And it, it was a great honor for my colleagues. There were about 500 people at the dinner. But we made an agreement. Excuse me. We made an agreement before I accepted the award. And that agreement was is they would give me nine minutes to talk about something I was passionate about. And I took 22 minutes. And that was, I wanted to enroll my colleagues at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. I wanted them to enroll them in a concern that's greater than any other patient, and that's a concern for the planet. Uh, I, I attempted to, and with some success, to get the American College of Lifestyle Medicine physicians who are food oriented to understand that we're eating the planet to death. And we have a message as members of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine that could save this planet. And that is we need to change. And people who accept this idea, who, um, who understand that a change in diet from the, the high meat Western diet to a vegan diet, you cut your contribution of, of global warming gases by 80% overnight. You know, it's a, it's a very profound message and it's one that I've spent a good share of my time on now. I just, uh, if we got the audio back, that'd be great. But uh, I put together a new website. It's actually supported by my foundation. And uh, the new website, which I would encourage you to go and visit is uh, mcdougallfoundation.org. Let me say that again. It's mcdougallfoundation.org. And there it talks about my new patient, which is planet earth. And uh, this website and, and myself is focused on trying to make a difference so that, well, I'll tell you, I said it during the, the, the meeting that uh, we we're talking about, you know, I started the, the lecture that I gave by saying something that I still say today. And that is that 
I don't want to ever have my grandchildren, I have seven of them, say, Grandpa, why didn't you try harder? You know, I, 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 that would be too hard for me to live with, is the fact that I didn't try harder to give them an opportunity to have a future. And right now they don't. So that's where my, my passion lives this day. Do we have any audio back? I don't know. I, are you still there, Dr. Herring? I'm still here, yeah. Okay, we, we can hear you. It's just sometimes you're, you're a little bit um, every other word. That picture is spectacular. You both look so fit and trim. Huh. Well, yeah, that was really, really a wonderful conference and a wonderful honor for you, Dr. McDougall. It was such a special time for me to be able to witness that too and, and have some discussion after that event. So if the audio is better now, yeah, um, it, it is. It looks like Dr. George Guthrie is behind Dr. McDougall's left shoulder and Dr. Adina Mercer. So I, I think that that's actually Dr. John Kelly. Oh, John Kelly. That's right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah that's right. So, you know, Dr. McDougall, what I was saying earlier is that, um, you know, you really opened up my eyes to you know, this, this idea of food as medicine back when I was even in college before medical school. And I came across your work um, really just by chance. And, but I, I really connected with it. It was like a light bulb went off in my head. I knew that this is the kind of medicine that I wanted to practice and the kind of doctor that I needed to be. And I really, I just want to thank you so much for all the work that you've done and you know, the education that you put out, being able to, to reach people like me, and, and you don't even know it necessarily. And, you know, to have this gift every day, right, to be able to really help patients get well, it's just such a special, a special part of my life. And you really, I think, changed my whole life, not just my career and giving me this, this path in medicine, but changing my whole life and how I approach my life. So it, I, I just want to thank you so much, and I hope you're having a wonderful birthday celebration. Well, thank you. You certainly added to it. In fact, I'd say you, you, there are a lot of positive things that have happened in the last uh, hour and a half, and I'll certainly always remember what you, your words and what you had to say. But you know, I can relate. I, I, I hated being a doctor until I discovered, until I discovered the importance of food. And, and then everything about medicine became exciting for me. And I, you know, I, I could spend a half an hour telling you about how I felt about medicine back when I was uh, trained in pushing drugs. And I never, I never really saw people ever getting well. And I thought I was a terrible doctor. But my interest in, uh, in medicine changed uh, almost overnight. And that's when I went back into training to become an internist. And what I saw was that I had something really important to contribute. And then everything became exciting for me. And I hope it has for you too. I wanted to know everything a cardiologist knew. I want to know everything an oncologist knew. You know, all of medicine became exciting. But before that, before I, I, I discovered this missing link, it all didn't never made any sense to me. So I, it's nice to see you as a young doctor starting out on a great career. And I know you're going to have a a very rewarding career, and it's just all about helping patients. It's uh, it's a real privilege to be able to touch people, to talk to them. Yes, absolutely. And you know, I'm I'm from the Midwest, so I'm I, I grew up in Illinois. So you know that potatoes are near and dear to my heart. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's it's one of my favorite foods. So <laughs> you know that even even just that. That part I really connected with up front, but I just want to say, you know, Dr. McDougall, I could remember when I first came across your work, I just would sit and listen to, you know, your lectures for hours, even some of the older lectures where you were talking with Dr. Dennis Burkett, uh, Nathan Pritikin, and I mean, that got me really thinking about population health as well. So, I, you know, I trained in preventive medicine at Loma Linda, so I'm coming at it kind of through multiple lenses, right, with thinking about population health, but also, right, the, the individual patient right in front of you and just really being able to help them get well. So thank you so much. I don't want to take up any much more time than this, but it's been a real pleasure talking with you. I could listen to you all day. <laughs> <laughs>
that's yeah, so I'm hoping that we can connect again in person. I'm not sure if you're going to go to the the American College of Lifestyle Medicine conference this year. It's going to be in Orlando again. Right. Well, my my grandkids are trying to convince Grandpa that he'd have a good time at Disney World. So I don't know. We might end up there. <laughs> Uh, you know, the world is changing so rapidly, it's hard to say, but uh, certainly I, I feel very comfortable being around other doctors who understand that there's a better way to do things. And uh, it would be be fun for us. We enjoyed our last meeting and I was uh, able to do a couple of conferences over the internet. I, I was uh, one of the speakers for the 2020 American College Lifestyle Medicine meeting which we do over the internet. And I, 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 I certainly enjoy the time, but you never know. Right now, right now we haven't bought our tickets. <laughs> yeah, so we'll see what happens. And so I think that I'll, I'll take off here, but it was really a pleasure talking with you. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, as, as I say, I, I can feel your enjoyment. I can tell you're, you have a wonderful time being a doctor. And unfortunately, most of our colleagues are not happy. And it's because they're not helping people and they know it. It's not because of the, of the problems with administrative duties and the lawsuits that are threatening doctors so commonly. It's because their patients, plain and simple, don't get better. If the patient got better, if they could see people with rheumatoid arthritis uh, cured in just a matter of uh, you know, a few days, um, if you see people getting off blood pressure medications and diabetic medications and losing the excess body fat, they would, they would keep going to work because, because the greatest gift in life is helping other people. That's where the reward comes from. And uh, I'm glad you've discovered it. It's, it's nice to hear. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, enjoy the rest of your talk here and enjoy the, your, your birthday celebration as well. All right, thank, thank you, you, Dr. Herring. And please feel free to come back anytime yeah. if you want and do a lecture. And Dr. You know, McCool is gonna be attending his 50th medical school reunion this fall. You know, I, I wanted to say, because I have his picture up here right in front of me, as Mary was saying, I don't know how it came up, somehow with the grandkids or something. Do you remember when you saw the Nathan Pritikin lecture? You saw me interviewing Nathan Pritikin? <laughs> yeah, I look just like you. <laughs> I, was, I was probably your age when I did that. Uh, but you know, I had that, that beautiful baby face, just like you, <laughs> believe me, it, it, it ages. So anyway, you, you brought back to, did, did you see yes. it? Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, enjoy your youth. <laughs> okay. Nice talking with you all. Have a nice Thank day. You so. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Yeah. Remember last year, Dr. McDougall, when you thought you were coming on the show to give a lecture that you had prepared, and then we surprised you with a, a surprise party with Dr. Ornish and Dr. Esselstyn right, and yeah. Dr. Campbell. That was so much fun. That's still on YouTube. People should watch that because that really was a great testimonial. Oh, that was, it was a great, yeah. that was a great day. That was hard to pull off. I needed Mary <laughs> for that one for sure. No, that was, yeah, that but was you great. did it. Yeah, great honor. you did it. That was a lot of fun. Anybody so, who wants to see the uh, the Nathan Pritikin interview I did, it's it's, a, it's a, the hour long interview. And you'll see pictures shots of me as, as a young doctor. <laughs> that hour long interview is in my February 2013 newsletter. And the Dennis Burkett interview that he mentioned was in my is in my January 2013 newsletter. And you'll see pictures of me as a young doctor, and and uh, I get you know. You were probably about forty. Well, but, but not with the Nathan Pritikin thing. I think I was uh, probably more in my early thirties. Well, were you still in, in Hawaii when we were you still did in that? Hawaii? It was, it was okay. just well, then you, we lived, then you were probably thirty-five. Yeah. Yeah, when we lived, uh, we lived in uh, <coughs> in uh, not in, in Kailua, you know, in uh, Luna High Street. Yeah, Mount Willie. Yeah. Okay. Then That's, you had to be about. Yeah, 35. we we had we had Nathan Pritikin over our house for dinner. Which was, would you uh, serve them? Do you remember? Pardon, mm. Would you serve them? Go ahead, you, remember, you probably remember, Mary. Oh, I don't know. I remember well, yeah. I remember where we lived, and I remember, yeah. uh, but I, <clears throat> I'm sorry, don't remember where you served. Yeah. Well, it was probably a pasta dish. <coughs> he, was, he was a very shy man, and uh, I asked him to sign my book, which is gone. I lost it in the fire. <laughs> but uh, he did. And, Put a few short words down there and you know one of the great honors that i've had in my career is that that um, 
the only the only forward to any book that Nathan Pritikin ever wrote was to my book, The McDougal Plan. And, and the reason he was he didn't write any forwards to other books is because he didn't believe in the doctors. He was afraid that it would result in a lot of extra trouble for him. But he did. He wrote uh, he wrote the the forward to my book. You can see it. You, the McDougal Plan is available. Um, you, I'm sure in used bookstores you can get it or someplace on the internet. And, oh, probably uh, Amazon has it. Probably as yeah, a, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's called book. the McDougal Plan. What he did is what I asked him to write is I said, look, you know, you recommend a diet with a little bit of skim milk and a little bit of uh, he fed people meat, poultry, fish, a few times a week. That's all. And I said, well, you know, there'll be a time when, uh, you know, there'll be a time when people ask what's the difference between the McDougal diet and the pretty good program. And uh, at that point, I, I understood that he would be always more popular, more respected than I ever would be. And so I, I asked him, I said, would you write what you see the difference in, in dietary programs are? And he did. And he said in time, it would uh, turn out whether one approach to the other was better. And, and I have to say with what's happened with the environment and with the movement for animal rights, the fact that I decided way back then that this was going to be a vegan diet, a low fat vegan diet. It was based a, a lot off of Nathan Pritikin's work that you needed to have a, he didn't call it starch based, he called it whole grain. And, you know, that, uh, that it would go one step further and it would eliminate all animal products. And I just didn't realize how important it was to make that decision. It was tough to decide that I was gonna take one big step different than anybody else had done, any medical doctor had done. And that was to have a completely animal product free diet. And, and I have to say, if I was with Nathan Pritikin again, that, uh, that uh, I, I think I made the right decision. And at his time, see, because he's worried about his popularity, he just thought that he would get so much uh, criticism if he eliminated all the animal foods from the diet. And he would have, you know, you got to remember this was back in the 1970s and, and 80s, early 80s. Uh, he'd have gotten into tremendous criticism from fellow doctors and dietitians. So he kind of made the whole, you know, everybody happy by including a little bit of this food, even though he himself was vegan. We had a party for Nathan uh, Pritikin. We had uh, a party at the Kanyo Yacht Club where we invited uh, my patients. About about 300 of my patients showed up and it was a potluck dinner. And he came there and, it, and I remember it well. He and his wife were, were attended and a few other people that were interested in his work. And, and what I remember is that he loved the food. The food tasted so good. He just kept saying this food tastes so good. I asked Nathan pretty pretty good if he wanted a glass of wine. I said, you know, you know, you said it that a glass of wine on occasion would be okay. He said, No, I don't. I don't want a glass of wine. <laughs> and uh, then what happened was we walked he and his wife Eileen out to the car after the party, and uh, and uh, Mary Mary brought with her a hundred of her recipes, and he said she said to him, you know, your, your food is, uh, I don't know how she put it, but I'm sure in a nice way, it was, it's not very tasty. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you a hundred recipes that you can use any way you want. You can use it in your, in your longevity center. You can use it in your next book, whatever you want. And so Mary gave him a hundred recipes. And the next book he published called The Pretty Can Promise. In the, uh, in the acknowledgements, he first thanked John and Mary McDougall for their contribution. That's wrong. He should have only thanked Mary McDougall because he included her recipes in that book. And from that point on, the, the Longevity Center served palatable food. It was good. It was tasty. We went pre and post our influence <laughs> on the Pritikin program, and it was a tremendous improvement. And, and actually, I ran across a, one of the dietetic people who worked in the longevity center. And that was the comment she made. Thank goodness you guys had, Mary had an influence on, on the Pritikin program because the food became palatable. Anyway, that's a story that is not often told. <laughs> well, that is great. Yep. What, there, without Mary, this, that would be very sustainable yeah. for most people. Yeah, it would have never worked out 
I have, I have I I've talked to you about my mentors. Mentors. In fact, I gave you a lecture on my mentors who are uh, Dennis Burkett, uh, Nathan Pritikin, uh, Walter Kempner, and uh, Roy Swank. It's one other one. I think no, that's, that's all. It. Okay. And, but you know, I knew uh, I knew these men except for Walter Kempner. I didn't ever get a chance to meet him, but I knew a lot about him. But I, I knew the other ones, the other mentors really well. And uh, they're really smart. In fact, uh, still at the Oregon Health and Science University, Roy Swank is known as a genius because he was a genius. Uh, for 23 years, he headed the neurology department at Oregon Health and Science University. He made that university millions and millions of dollars with his inventions. And of course he believed, and it's true that Multiple sclerosis is caused by the Western diet, and you can stop it with a healthy diet. Anyway, I, I met their wives too, and I saw what influence they didn't have. And what it turned out is I had one trick that they didn't have. I had one one card to play they didn't have, and that's Mary, you know, which made the food practical, made it taste good, made it work. And that's the advantage I have that has made me as successful as I, I've become is that I didn't, I couldn't have done it alone. I, I needed to, needed to be a partnership and anybody who knows us knows it's been a partnership for the last 50 years. And hopefully we'll have that partnership continue at least <laughs> another 25. What do you think? At Mary? least. That would be amazing. Well, then we'll do another show and you'll get another shirt. Yeah. Every, every 25 years, every you get another shirt. It's all right. You know, as delicious as all the recipes are, do you find that sometimes people have a little bit of trouble just at first going from a higher fat diet, whether it's vegan or animal products, to a lower fat diet? You know, I'll, I'll let Mary answer that question. Um, well, sometimes... But you know what we've really um, started to stress, and this is one thing I want, I want to emphasize, is that Heather has really taken over um, the program and she has um, started giving lectures on preparing foods and eating out and how to stock your kitchen because she has three teenage boys that she always has to cook for. So she's in the kitchen all the time. So what she has done is sort of taken my things and made them more, more simple. And um, when you teach people how to do things simply, it works really well B because, um, and this is what we so really sort of emphasize during the program, just, just find one or two things that you like that only have a few ingredients. And, um, and when, when they learn that they can just have sweet potatoes and broccoli for dinner, they're relieved. Because most people, when you say you're not going to eat any of that stuff you ate before, they always go, well, what am I going to eat? And we've tried to make it really simple. And um, I think that's what has changed and what has helped people to maintain this in the long term is that they can do things without spending all day in the kitchen. Yeah. You know, it's funny, you mentioned sweet potatoes and broccoli, which Dr. McDougall said we could actually live on. And it's pretty much my favorite meal and my lunch almost every day. And when I posted a picture on Facebook, I mean, people don't see that as a meal. You know, they're like, well, where do you get your protein? Yeah, well, I know it's really terrible. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's starting. Have you uh, gone on our, you, well, I know you have on our Instagram account. All the time I do when on your Instagram. People put pictures of their meals. And do you notice how simple yep. their meals are? And everybody is sort of getting into this idea that it can be really simple, like mashed potatoes and gravy and peas and corn. There was someone who put a picture of that as, look at this big bowl of food I'm eating tonight. And, and you with your sweet potatoes and broccoli and people are learning, I think. We actually have what, what's going on right now is a, a team potatoes and team, team rice. And um, the rice team is, 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 they like rice better. So they're fixing all these dishes with rice in them and keeping it really simple. And then team potatoes are showing us all the meals that they make with just potatoes because they really like potatoes. So I, I think that people are learning that if you keep it simple, it's much easier to do. It is so much easier. It's cheaper and it can be really delicious too. Like if you're eating oh, your favorite. It is really delicious. And I think once people find out
that, you know, oh, I can really have just a bowl of pasta with marinara sauce and that could be my dinner. And uh, then they realize that it's okay. I don't have to have all this different stuff. And yep. once, well, and that's one thing that we emphasize during the program. And, and I think it's really made a difference in how people look at the food. So I think that's one of the main differences in, in people. You're wondering what people are eating now, you know, that, that, they're, that they think that's so shocking to have, you know, a meal of sweet potatoes and broccoli. I can't, uh, AJ, I can't even imagine what some of these people must eat. Uh, you know, I mean, you don't see ads um, on TV except for people eating these giant burgers um, or mainly that these giant burgers are big slices of pizza. Um, but you don't really see anybody making a, a home cooked meal and see what's really on their plate. And uh, um, I think that you find that, that they eat the same thing over and over again, too. Right. But they're eating junky food. And yeah. There's a question from Anthony. What brand of B12 do the McDougals take? Well, that's that's an open ended question. I don't know what the right answer is. Uh, when I when I <laughs> came to my first recommendations, which are in the McDougal plan book, I recommend a, a cyanocobalamin. Well, he's he's actually asking what brand we eat. like what company? No, I, I have I, no I, idea. I have no idea. We just buy whatever is available at Amazon or or on the shelves. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what you asked. I'll try. There's the answer. But maybe you wanted to know what kind. Of yeah. Cause there's, there's three kinds, right? Yeah. There's a methyl hydroxy and a cyanocobalamin. And uh, initially I recommended the cyano cause that's basically what's all available, but that's cyanide based. And the research came out, I, I got a paper that said, you know, you, the, uh, the methyl and hydroxy forms really are the only ones that help with whatever. I think probably preventing neurologic disease or whatever. <clears throat> and then I got another paper that came out that said, no, no, you have to, add, you have to have the cyano form or you don't get reversal of something or other. And it, you know, it's left me confused. I don't care really because science changes and the research is incomplete. And, you know, as, as a result, when I've come to a conclusion that has been satisfactory for us, is if you go into our pantry, you'll find three different kinds of cabalon. And, and this will be the methyl, the, the uh, hydroxy and the cyanoform. And what I will do is uh, on occasion, I can't tell you how frequently that is, but it's not every day, <laughs> is I'll take and I'll reach into the three bottles and I'll bring out you know, three of these pills, which are huge doses, you know, far in excess of anything my body would ever need. And I'll put uh, three pills on the counter for Mary and I'll take three pills myself and, and I've covered all bases. And, and then uh, we forget about it for about a month. At least. <laughs> but you no, know, we recommend you take B12. Be, be clear that we do recommend it. Oh, yeah. So, but you don't have to take it very often. And uh, Certainly not every day. No, you, you don't need to take it every day. And which is the best form? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, there'll be another paper that comes out that has one recommendation or another. But right now, if you take the three forms, you can't miss. Yep. Okay. So before uh, Dr. Herring came on, I was asking a question from Johanna. And I'm going to actually share the screen again because can you see this, Dr. McDougall? Yes. Okay, so, so she, her question was, why do places like Harvard send out information like this knowing it's wrong? Because I'm having a hard time convincing my family that all oil is yeah. bad. Well, no, I, I actually, I, I, can't, I can't recall if I'd have been prepared, I would have brought the study and read it more recently. But, uh, you know, usually what these studies do is they, they compare... Uh, the rich Western diet with the Mediterranean oh, diet, which promotes, uh, I, won't, I won't have a chance to read it, which promotes okay. olive oil and nuts and nuts. And this is ba based on the, uh, anyways. Based Research on, by the olive oil company. Right, I'm trying, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the, of the conglomerate study that came out. Oh, okay. Anyway, pretty med study, okay? Uh, and this is a study that, uh, that is of the Mediterranean diet. And it was supported by, by three olive oil companies, one from California, two from Spain. 
and financially supported by one nut company. And so they had big interest in showing that the pretty med diet was uh, the best diet, which is based upon the Mediterranean diet. And you know, obviously know what their interests are. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is the Mediterranean diet is better than the rich Western diet. Why? Because it's based on fruits and vegetables. And uh, it's, it's, it's a good diet in spite of the olive oil, not because of it. So, you know, that, that's the underlying conclusion. There was another study that came out recently that claimed that low fats diets don't work. And uh, I, I don't think this is the study, but it was one that we could have talked about again on this show. And I could explain to you what they did on their low fat diet is 30% fat. You know, we recommend a diet that's seven percent fat, and so what they do is they design a a program where they do a randomized control trial, and the low fat diet is you know a, a few percentage points lower in fat than the high fat diet, and they ask you to believe that a low fat diet doesn't work. Well, anytime you see this kind of study, you go, well, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit with Dr. McDougall and Dr. Orange say. You know, Dr. Esselstyn doesn't fit with, with, with these, these people we have respect for say, how, how did they get such results? What they did is they compared diets with basically have the same amount of fat in them. And you can figure this out very quickly. Just look, just look through the study and quickly see what they served. You know, low fat diets, 28% uh, fat. Uh, high fat diet is 32% fat. Excuse me. Anyway, it's just a matter of manipulating the methodology to get the outcomes that you're looking for. And uh, you can usually find out what the answer is gonna be by looking at the funding source. And then you know pretty much, anyway, what's gonna happen. Just like we, we, we you know, this is something that's gonna be included in the, in the course we're giving on, on aging. It's uh, you know, aging gracefully. And it talks about sarcopenia and I think we, uh, maybe not, but it's been a, a while. Uh, it was always one of, our, one of our meetings that we have every two weeks with our patients. Somebody asked about sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is where you lose muscle mass as you get older. And uh, they want to know what I thought about the idea of, uh, of this being a protein deficiency problem and that it's solved by eating more meat or taking amino acid supplements. And my thought was it doesn't make any sense at all because the body never stores protein. It always excretes protein through the liver and then through the kidneys. If the body stored protein, if you just fed more protein, you ended up storing more protein, it would store the protein in the muscles. And so it corrects sarcopenia, but the body doesn't store protein. We'd all look like bodybuilders if the, if the body stored protein, it doesn't. So anyway, I went and looked at the, the research to make sure that I was up to date. And, you know, the first 25 studies I <coughs> found on the, on the internet were studies that uh, were contrary to what I'd said. You know, there were studies that show that eating meat and taking these supplements actually helped in terms of uh, muscle, building more muscle. And then I looked at, uh, there were five, five independently done studies. You see the studies that all said that eating more meat or taking supplements were paid for by the pork, the egg, the beef industry, and or some kind of supplement industry. So I went and looked at the independent research that was done and I pulled up six articles, which I'd be happy to share with you some other time. I can't grab them right now, but six articles that looked at the, all the evidence, independent research, and they came to the conclusion that in, in, uh, unless you're dealing with really sick people, like people with cancer, you, you don't end up building any muscle mass by feeding more meat or these amino acid supplements. Yes, you can build muscle mass and have a, a positive effect on sarcopenia, sarco muscle penia, you know, too little. You can have uh, you can have a positive effect by exercise. That's not what they were selling. They weren't selling exercise. They were selling pork, and poultry, and beef, and eggs. And if you looked at the research papers carefully, you found the funding source was just that, or various supplement industries. But when it was independently reviewed, 
and unbiased researchers looked at the evidence, they consistently came to the conclusion this is nonsense. You know, feeding muscle does not build muscle. Exercise does, but who can sell you exercise? I mean, that's a nonprofit thing. So you be careful when you read the research. And anytime you want to challenge me on what's going on, I'd be glad to, you know, to relook at the evidence, just like I did with this discussion we just had of uh, a DHA and EPA being essential so you don't become brain dead, develop <laughs> Alzheimer's dementia, which is promoted by snake oil salesmen. Not going to mention who they are. You know, I'm not that unkind of a person. But anyway, um, you know, I showed you, in fact, you passed out the research to people. Uh, AJ, you know, when you look at independent research, you find out what the truth is, usually. Or they admit they don't know. What they don't know in these studies of DHA and EPA is why all the efforts they've made, why they don't show positive outcomes, why you don't prevent Alzheimer's or dementia, why you don't reverse Alzheimer's dementia by feeding these essential fats. Anyway, you as good consumers, you'll look at the evidence and not be fooled, right? You won't, you won't, you won't fit into the category of suckers born every day. Yeah, you're good consumers, so take a look. It's all there. It's just so interesting how scared people get when they see, you know, a certain vegan doctor promoting these things. And, you yeah. know, yeah. uh, you know, they, these people, they, they're, they're selling and you and I have in mind some of who some of these people are. They're selling partially a true message. Uh, they're on our side of the fence in terms of, of battling for good nutrition for people. So, you know, they're not completely unfriendly like the Atkins people or the very serious people or, you know, or the, Anyway, the whole list of them out there, the zone guy, Barry Sears and David. Are they still around? Uh, yeah, they are. But, you know, like Sally Fallon, they're just getting fatter and fatter and fatter. <laughs> so anyway, um, I don't know what my point was. What All was right. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll throw another question your way. This is from JJ. And she wanted to know, can Hashimoto's thyroiditis be reversed? And would taking thyroxin now be a good idea because she has no energy or should she wait until her weight has normalized and she's compliant on the, doc on the no, diet? It cannot be reversed. Uh, this is an autoimmune disease where the body attacks the thyroid gland. And we did a whole lecture a, a couple of months ago on autoimmune diseases and how the body attacks itself. And I explained to you, likely the body gets confused because people eat foreign thyroid glands. You go to a slaughterhouse, they waste nothing. They take the thyroids from the pigs and the cows and they turn them into sausage. The body gets confused because of these four thyroid glands that are consumed. The body attacks your own native thyroid gland and you destroy it. It's called Hashimoto's thyroiditis or autoimmune thyroiditis. It's dead, not gonna come back. I don't care if you lose weight, it's not gonna come back. But, but let, me, let, let me qualify that a little bit is we studied in the 1,703 people that we studied, uh, we found that actually thyroid function improved when people changed their diet in seven days. Now, I never did anything with this data because, well, you know, basically I didn't know what to do with it uh, because it wasn't supposed to improve, but it did, it improved about one, T one TSH unit, micro-international units, the thyroid stimulating hormone but by one unit on average, it improved in seven days. So there appears to be some reversal that occurs. I don't think the thyroid gland itself uh, recovers. I think that some other metabolic change that takes place in the body that makes the thyroid more, work more effectively or whatever. Anyway, uh, losing weight shouldn't make a difference. Uh, the gland is dead. What you need to do is you need to take thyroid medication and I only prescribe Synthroid. I don't prescribe uh, thyroid extracts like Armour Thyroid. And the reason I don't is because they are made from glands of pigs and cows. You stick your nose in the bottle, it stinks. So uh, not only is it of concern because of the reliability of uh, quote natural thyroid, Armour Thyroid, but because along with the thyroid gland are past microbes 
mad cow prions, viruses that cause cancer. You know, you should not be taking these glandulars. They're, they're potentially dangerous. So I use Synthroid and yes, you should take Synthroid or you know, some type of thyroid supplementation and, and it may solve your fatigue problem, but most people are fatigued or not because of their thyroid glands because they're not in very good shape. And uh, giving thyroid medication for fatigue is rarely, uh, rarely results in people feeling better. So you should tell what, what normal numbers are for thyroid. A, a, a normal TSH level is two microinternational units. If you take too much thyroid, then it is suppressed. It become like one or 0.5. If you have inadequate thyroid, either gland is producing inadequate amounts or you're not taking enough medication, then the TSH level is elevated to say four or six or eight. I, I've seen some profoundly hypothyroid people who have TSH levels in the twenties. These people need very careful treatment. And uh, you know, they're in pretty big trouble when they have that profound hypothyroidism. Anyway, when you start your thyroid supplement, the, the benefits don't, uh, don't appear for about three to six weeks. That's because the thyroid medication that I prescribe, T4, takes about three to six weeks to be converted to the more active form of thyroid, which is called T3. Anyway, if you want to find this written up uh, in a concise form, you go to drmcdougall.com. You add in the little, micro, the little magnifying glass, the question bar. You add hypothyroidism. There's a whole article I wrote that tells you pretty much what I said. Uh, most of the things that I've talked to you about today and in the past, uh, I've either put in uh, books or in newsletters, and they can be found on our website, drmcdougall.com. Uh, or I'll make, uh, I'll make updated uh, lectures, webinars that you can find on YouTube. So, and a lot of the stuff we talked about today, AJ also has up on her YouTube channel of, of lectures that you've given oh, yeah, yeah. to her group already. So anyway, you're going to give a couple of books away, AJ? Yeah, you want me to do it now, Doctor McDougal? There was well, two I, questions. I, I was going to try. Try. You know, let's let's go with you because I, I was going to say, but well, you're only you're only giving two books away. Well, I, I, actually, I'm not even the one giving them away. I, a generous viewer named Lisa Worson bought two books for U.S. Uh -huh. residents, and we were. I have two two McDougal trivia questions, but we uh, can now. I can save the two questions for next time if you like. No, no, I I just I didn't want. I just was going to suggest. Never mind. That's good. <laughs> I, this is a very good book. Yeah, thank Mary, you. Mary loves it. And uh, I, I was honored by being asked to write the forward to it. And I hope it adds to the book. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. Appreciate that very much. Uh, Lillian, which was my mother's name, has a question. And she's, she's, she's saying you're saying a little bit wrong because she says it's a question about following the McDougal plan where you say the oil you eat is the oil you wear. I, I believe you yeah. say the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And she but, says, but what other reasons are there for not eating oil? Well, oil, vegetable oil only occurs after processing. You know, you have to do something to the olive, like squeeze it to get the oil to come out. And of course there's further refinement of the oils too. When, when you, I, when you take it, have free oil, you isolate the oil out of all the other ingredients that are in the natural plant. So like, for example, in the corn kernel, you leave behind the carbohydrate, the protein, the vitamins, the minerals, the fibers, you leave everything behind. And what you do is you suck out the oil and you've got an isolated concentrated nutrient oil. And at best, it's a drug. At worst, it's a serious toxin. Uh, your omega-6 fats, which are from corn oil, uh, that's dominantly, predominantly in omega-6, they cause uh, heart disease. Your omega-3 fats, they cause, they suppress the immune system and they cause bleeding problems and they suppress the immune system and increase the cancer growth and make you more susceptible to infections. So like I say, when you give a drug to somebody, you have both positive and negative effects. Oil is a drug at best. And you're going to pay the price for it. In addition to the fat you eat, is the fat you wear. 
These oils promote cancer, they promote heart disease, they promote bleeding to the point where you can bleed to death. They suppress the immune system, encourage cancer to grow in your body. They set you up for viral infections. Don't do it. <laughs> you, know, you know why oil is so popular and why you're having trouble giving it up is because you're used to oil in your food. You're used to cooking with it and when you leave the oil out, you won't miss it at all. But the problem with leaving oil out of a lot of foods is it, the manufacturers haven't figured out a way to make the food taste good without oil. It's not the oil that tastes good. I would challenge you to drink a bottle of olive oil. It doesn't taste good. Well, the oil does is it serves as a vehicle <clears throat> that allows the salt to stick to the French fries and potato chips. It, it, it provides a vehicle to allow the sugar to stick to the donuts and to provide a vehicle to allow the spices to stick to the salad leaves. You love spice, you love salt, and you love sugar. If you could figure out some way to get these ingredients that you love associated with your food without the oil, then you'd have a much tremendously healthier product. And that's what we've done. Let's take and, state route 65. And that's what Mary's done in her recipes is she's figured out ways to get flavor in the food without the oil. Oil doesn't taste good. It's disgusting. It does by itself. It by itself, it tastes terrible. Yeah. 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 You got to put it, you got to use it with a donut and sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's funny. Okay. So this is from, and I've actually heard other people say this, so it's kind of important from Jacqueline. She says that this has actually happened to her and her sister and her daughter that when they eat a heavy starch breakfast like oatmeal, they experience hunger an hour later and sometimes feel a bit shaky. But if they eat protein like a, a two eggs or a chicken thigh, they can go for hours. Mm -hmm. And um, why does this happen? Why do some people feel more satiated on animal protein uh, than they do on starches? Well, that's contrary to the science. Uh... The science, uh, you know who this investigator is, Susan, what's her last name? Uh, Dr. Susanna Holt. Holt, yeah, Susanna Holt, thank you. Uh, Susanna Holt, she did experiments where she fed various kinds of foods and that she developed something called a satiety index. And what we find is uh, like, for example, potatoes are the most satiating of all foods. They're about uh, three times as satiating as meat or dairy. And they're seven times more satiating than croissants. So the science says that the carbohydrates are the ones that are satiating. You might have figured this out because you have taste buds on the tip of your tongue for sugar. There are no taste buds on the tip of the tongue for protein. You're not a protein seeker. Your cat is, but you aren't. Your cat has, uh, it has uh, uh, taste buds for proteins and amino acids on the tip of its tongue. I think instead what it is, it's just a matter of behavior and familiarity. And the best way for me to explain it to you is what we call the Chinese restaurant syndrome. In the old days, when I used to go to a Chinese restaurant, uh, the response was just what you said. You know, an hour later, you're hungry. Why? Because you had a meal of vegetables and rice and tiny bits of meat at most. But through, you know, through changes in habits, and it usually doesn't take very long at all, and we've proved this in our patient populations, what happens is you learn to get satiety from starches. So I, I think you just are, are still hooked on, on the old responses. You know, you're used to getting satiated by a, a, a lump of muscle and a glob of fat in your stomach. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I would say if, if if someone is eating um, a sandwich of eggs and chicken and cheese yeah. um, for breakfast, yeah. and they, they well, probably one have, day they, they probably they, learned the diet, have they? <laughs> no. Then the next day they try a bowl of oatmeal. Well, they probably don't like the oatmeal very much, and so they don't eat very much of it. Yeah. If they ate as much of the oatmeal as they did of the eggs and and chicken and cheese sandwich, till they were stuffed. Yeah. And they probably find out that they it lasted a lot longer, okay. and, and those old taste buds are still getting you. Why would they get shaky though? I I, I don't know. 
Well, I, I would guess because they didn't eat enough oatmeal. Maybe it was from the potato. Maybe it was from the bacon and the eggs from the day before. <laughs> Uh, I, I, there's no reason they should. In fact, a highly effective way to treat hypoglycemia is to put people on a high starch diet. Right. So, I, I, I don't know. I, all I would say is that what you ought to do is you ought to give yourself a, a test of some reasonable time. Uh, why don't you make a sincere commitment to eating a starch based diet? And as Mary said, eat a lot. You should see the size of oatmeal I have every morning. You know, I, I could not get by with the size uh, that I used to eat in terms of, of eggs and whatever sausage or whatever else this person was eating. I mean, that's a, that's a small amount of food. I got to eat a large amount of food to get satisfied to keep me going for the rest of the day. So, yeah, it's, it's just like, you know, the, 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 a similar response would be, why do I get tired after I eat starches? You know, you shouldn't. You shouldn't because you know the, the people who are the best athletes in the world who run 26 mile marathons and triathlons eat a high starch diet. That's where the energy comes from. And I'd give you the New York Marathon, which they ran a couple of months ago. That was won by two Kenyans. Kenya, you know, the African countries. Two Kenyans, a man and a woman. They, they each were from Kenya who won the marathon in New York. And their diet is 80% corn. If you look at the Chicago Marathon and the Honolulu Marathon, what you'll find is the winners either are from Ethiopia or from Kenya, where they eat a diet that's 80% corn. These are the strongest athletes in the world. They, they also are very thin. <laughs> Think they have sarcopenia? I doubt it. I don't think so. <laughs> Here's a question about shingles. Beverly's husband, who is a vegan who eats really well, has had pain yeah. for five months taking large doses of gabapentin and marijuana gummies. Any thoughts to help shingles? Boy, that's a tough one. You know, shingles is caused by reactivation of the uh, chickenpox virus. So what happens is people have been infected with chickenpox and the chickenpox virus lives in the nerves somehow or another get, gets reactivated. Boy, is that a tough one. Uh, I've never had shingles myself, but I've taken care of a lot of patients with shingles. They'll, they'll say that's the worst pain they've ever had. Well, there's no food that you can eat that makes it go away. You just or have to wait. Or causes it. Yeah, you, you just, just have, have to, wait. to wait. And um, uh, there, there's, you know, there's some antiviral drugs that if, get, if they're given early, they will make a difference in the clinical course of shingles. But they have to be given early. And uh, your doctor, I'm sure, is well aware of those medications and they should have been prescribed. But otherwise, you just, you know, you, you put ice packs on them or, uh, you know, you, you just make yourself comfortable the best you can. The, the pain relieving drugs that you're taking, which would be, it was marijuana and what else? Gabapentin is what he's Gabapentin, taking. Gabapentin, yeah. You know, I, I don't think that they're, they're very good pain relieving drugs, but at least you're not going to get addicted like you would with opioids. You got to be real careful about treating pain, especially with the potent opioid, opioids that are out there these days. People are getting overdosed and addicted to a tremendous, a tremendous high number of people, but release their pain. Uh, Carrie says, what do you prescribe for Graves' disease? Graves disease is, uh, is a condition, it's an autoimmune condition related to the thyroid gland and you get a goiter and you get exophthalmos, which is where the eyes bug out. And uh, I don't remember what the treatment is for that. Let's see, iodine to correct the goiter. Uh, no, I, I'd, have to, I'd have to review that. I mean, it's been so long since I've taken care of somebody with Graves disease. I'm just lucky I remember what it is. <laughs> I'm 75 years old today. Come on now. I've been talking to you for three hours. <laughs> well, uh, well, actually, we started late today because of the technical glitch. But yes, oh, yeah. you're yeah. absolutely right. I'm kind of stalling because there may be another doctor popping in. It's just, you know, you know how these doctors are. They, they, yeah. they see patients, you know. You know how that is, right? Yeah. Uh, Anthony says, is it okay to use a deodorant that doesn't have aluminum? Yeah, deodorants don't have aluminum. 
uh, antiperspirants have aluminum. Okay, the, the difference is, is uh, aluminum chloride stops the sweat glands from making water perspiration. And deodorants just uh, cover up the scent. So yeah, but as you mentioned, AJ, if you eat plants, you smell like plants. You eat dead animals, you smell like dead animals. So you, you'll have, body odor is normal, it's natural, it's, it's, it's attractive if you eat a good diet and you're a healthy person. So you should smell, <laughs> it's just, even though, you know, because people smell so disgusting because of their diet, we've considered body odor to be a negative thing. It's, it's an important thing for sexual attractiveness. Uh, you, you fall in love based upon smells. So as we talked about, it's the perfume industry. The, the, the nose is attached, is attached to the olfactory lobe, which is the lobe of the brain. And so you have these hairs in your nose, which uh, pick up the chemical sensation, the smell, and these hairs, which are ner little nerve endings, they go straight into nerves in the olfactory lobes of the brain. And then these olfactory lobe of the brain, it goes into a section of the brain uh, called the limbic system, which controls emotion. They're, they're direct, direct contact, just whoop, like that. It goes into the limbic system where you control your emotions when this is where you fall in love and where you experience hunger or hunger satisfaction. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it's the way you smell. And I, I would have to make a general statement as you fall in love based on odor. <laughs> Yeah, sight's okay too. You know, I mean, it, it carries you a certain certain way. But you know, if you're going to get very intimate, what you're going to do is you're going to be dealing with 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 olfactory sensations and odor. I mean, think about think about your your animals, your pets. How important is smell to them in terms of their their uh, interest in human beings and other animals? Pretty important too, huh? Especially a dog. I mean, think about a dog. Every time I walk in the room with a dog, what they want to do is they want to sniff me. <laughs> and, then, and, and then they spend the rest of the day sniffing, you know what, on other animals and themselves. I'm not going to say what they sniff, but you, you're a dog owner, you know what they sniff. It's just like shaking hands for them, you know? Yeah, I guess Yeah, but so. you, can, you can also tell, I mean, sometimes dogs will sniff somebody and they'll take an instant dislike to that person just by the way they smell. And um, they can sniff somebody else and they'll think, oh, this is my best friend. Please pet me. We have we have a real dog lover in our family, and and uh, it, she trains dogs to identify certain scents, uh, like to find bodies and stuff like that. And her moms her, and um, doesn't yeah, she yeah moms and, and, and uh, things cadavers. Like yeah, yeah. So when it's got a bunch of stiffened dogs that are really talented, and they go to you know catastrophes and. Anyway, dogs, are, odor is really important. But I, it is important for people too. I, I know that uh, we have a different attitude about in our society, but I think we're wrong. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not gonna change everything. I'm not gonna stop you from washing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when, I, when I get to the point where you say, Dr. McDougall says you should only bathe once every two months. <laughs> then I gotta quit. <laughs> Didn't back in the day, didn't they only bathe like every six months? Isn't that where they got the saying, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater? Uh, probably. Probably. <laughs> because the head of the family always bathed first. Or I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Well, things have changed a lot. And uh, I don't know that's all for the better. That's funny. <laughs> Here's a good question for you, Mary. Any advice on eating healthfully while traveling? <sighs> We don't, well, we don't travel we don't, anymore. <laughs> we don't travel anymore. And when we did travel, you know, we went to places that were, you know, we had, when we traveled, we had an adventure travel business. And so we knew where we were going and was going to have McDougal food. Or when we travel, we'd go home to visit, you know, our kids. And um, our kids would have the right kind of foods. Um, oh, 
can't remember the last yeah. time we traveled and had to worry about food. Well, we, we know how, I, maybe the question is eating out. We have a whole lecture on eating out that we give to participants. As a matter of fact, you should have Heather on sometime. She gives that lecture. Well, Heather, Heather is booked. She had to postpone it because of her house, but she she is on very yeah. soon. I, I saw her yeah, name okay. on the schedule. Well, she's, she's very talented at things I'll like be, eating out. Trying to get her for a while. Yes, absolutely. That, that's why we started the adventure business, which we, we've been on approximately 30 trips. Where we've taken somewhere between 80 and 300 people to various parts of the world. And the reason we started these is uh, people would call up and they say, well, you know, there's a problem that is that I want to go on vacation. And for me to go on vacation means I'm going to gain weight and get sick. And so our answer to that was, well, we'll put on vacations for you where you won't get sick or gain weight. And th that so, so came out the McDougal adventure business, <clears throat> highly successful. We, as a, we were saving you know, thousands of people to parts of the world. But uh, That's, it was really amazing what they did with the food too. Yeah, Most of the time it was oh, really yeah, fabulous. Yeah, wonderful food. We of course had to work hard. You know, Mary or particularly Mary and Heather, they worked really hard with the chefs to make sure that the food was right. We took uh, three, three cruises to Alaska. We took uh, one trip down the Amazon, the group of people. <laughs> uh, we took uh, three trips to uh, Costa Rica on a cruise ship. We took one trip to Belize on a cruise ship. A small uh, cruise ship where we had the whole ship. Yeah, and uh, we, we also took many land-based trips. We've taken probably 20 land-based trips to hotels and we would change the, uh, the kitchen. And that's why one of the reasons people travel with us is they, they really like the fact that they could eat healthy food and wouldn't have to worry about it. And they met a lot of like-minded people. And we tried to simulate some of those experiences, you know, now that we're not running a program at a resort, we we've tried to uh, tried to help with the camaraderie. And so what we have in addition now is we have a meeting with the patients, which is uh, unattended by any staff. And so they get together in the morning before Mary and I, Mary and my fireside chat, they get together in the morning, they just talk with each other. And they make friends and you know it's their chance to talk about how they're doing and you know talk about their family and any complaints that they have about the program which fortunately are not often heard or not often made so we you know we recognize how important the the friendship and camaraderie are and the communication you have with people we, we've done a good job of, of uh uh compensating for the fact that we don't get together in a tiny cruise ship or at a hotel. We now get together over the internet and we, you know, we have a lot of fun. Anyway, nice. we said a lot about the program this time. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel about eating one meal a day? There's somebody watching that says she follows your program, but eats one meal a day. Can I maintain safely and not compromise my Hashimoto's? Well, I don't know that it would have anything to do with Hashimoto's. One meal a day is uh, okay, you know, that that would be fine. I couldn't do it. I would, I'd be hungry. I'd be hungry too. Uh, three but, three meals a day is just a tradition. You're 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 better able to lower your uh, cholesterol, and you're better able to lose weight if you eat frequently. When they compare gorgers, say people eat one, two, or three times a day, with grazers, people who say eat fourteen times a day. Those who are graze, nibble, uh, they end up uh, more effectively losing weight. And there's some reasons why, but um, I don't need, no, I need to go into them, but there, there are reasons why that, well, I'll go into them. When you, when you <laughs> nibble, what happens is you don't have to resort to storage mechanisms. You just have a couple of meals a day between these meals, your body shifts to storage. And so you don't do that when you, when you graze. Uh, you have more profound rises in insulin when you gorge as opposed to grazing. If you take and you, you uh, average out the insulin spikes of eating and you compare them with somebody who grazes 14 times a day with say somebody who, who gorges twice a day, you find that there's much more insulin produced on the gorging pattern. 
and insulin drives fat into fat cells. It also is one of the things that brings on hunger uh, by lowering blood sugar, the insulin produced. And so you stay more satisfied throughout the day and you don't have these large amounts of insulin produced which stuff fat into fat cells. And that's all I remember. <laughs> right. Randy has a question. Do any of your grandchildren want to continue in your footsteps and become a doctor? But, you know, they're so young that we don't know yet. We have our first grandson who's going to college and uh, he's been accepted to Oregon State University. So we'll be visiting with him quite often. In fact, maybe we'll have him on the show. Uh, <laughs> but we have, uh, you know, the other ones are, are pretty young and... Uh, so far, we have not had any yeah. of them say, oh, I wanted to be just like you, Grandpa. Well, we have, we have one son who's a medical doctor. He told you he's a professor at OHSU. You've had Craig on before, right? No, I've been dying to, but I'd really like to have him on to make his noodle dish more than even doctor. Yeah. <laughs> and then Heather's taken over the, the, uh, the foundation business and the for-profit business. So she's very much involved in the McDougal program. And then... And have, she's really good at public speaking now, too, and she never used to be. Yeah. And then we have our, our other son, who's a, uh, a chemist. He's a PhD in chemistry, a very successful man. So. And all your kids follow the McDougal diet, right? And they grandkids. Do. Yeah. They do. They all, all of them and their spouses do, too. And so do the grandkids. And they do it because they like the food. And they, they like having healthy kids too. So they feed them well. But it doesn't, doesn't mean they don't go to birthday parties and have ice cream, they do. And when Halloween comes around, they go trick or treating. But uh, as far as their general diet goes, it's strict McDougal. Cool. Some people are still insisting starches make them sleepy, especially Japanese sweet potatoes. Yeah. That, that, what was that book? Potatoes, not Prozac. Didn't she recommend eating a potato? Yeah, that, that was, uh, that was, uh, Kathleen de Maison. So who it was? Yeah. I've interviewed her. Yeah. Well, the whole idea was based upon Judith and Richard Wortman's work at MIT and, uh, Judith and Richard Wortman, what they did is they did research on, um, uh, on uh, what you eat and how you pass tryptophan through the nervous system. Tryptophan is the precursor for serotonin. And serotonin is the, uh, is the neurochemical that uh, will relieve depression, satisfies hunger, quiets the nervous system. And so when you, you have to have this influx of tryptophan into the nervous system to be converted into serotonin. What happens when you eat a high meat diet or animal food diet is you consume competitive neutral amino acids. And what these amino acids do that are in animal foods is they block the gates. There, there are gates between the blood and the spinal fluid, which is called the blood brain barrier. And so when you eat animal proteins, you block the same gates that allow tryptophan in the nervous system which makes serotonin, which, you know, is the depression relieving substance. Anyway, that was Richard Wortman's and Judith Wortman's work in the 1980s from MIT. Look them up. Their articles are still <laughs> on the internet. They're in the National Library of Medicine. They're very famous people. They made a great influence on me. They explained uh, how to relieve PMS by, by feeding women a high starch diet. They saw the benefits of eating starch, carbohydrates. Why? Because you don't have the heavy neutral amino acids. So you get plenty of uh, serotonin buildup in the nervous system because you transfer the tryptophan. They used to sell tryptophan, AJ. Uh, it was yeah. a, a supplement you used to be able to buy, but then the antidepressant industry, the ones that made SSRIs, <laughs> they, they got upset because of the competition. And they put the tryptophan supplement business out of business. There are a bunch of flimsy <laughs> excuses, but you know, it's just money. It's just business. Wow. I just saw somebody in the waiting room. Where did he go? 
um, come back. I'll, I'll, I'll tell them we're, we're texting. I'm, I'm doing many things at once, but uh, in, <laughs> while we're waiting for a, another, up oh, here he is. This is a very special doctor too. Wants to wish oh. you a happy birthday. I think Good. you know him and I think you like him very much. We're just getting ready for him to start his camera and sound. Oh, good. Uh, Wayne, is this Wayne? This is Dr. Wayne Dysinger, my doctor when I lived in the desert. And he still could be my doctor because he does virtual medicine too. Oh, we just God. need him to start his camera and his and his audio. Well, while you're waiting to, to, to start the camera, I just want you to know that Wayne Dysinger was the one of the few physicians who got behind SB 380 and helped me get past a law which forces physicians in California to learn about human nutrition and forces the 11 medical schools in California to teach nutrition. It's called SB 380. It's a California law that we testified on, Wayne Dysinger and myself, uh, before the legislature, and uh, it was passed it was passed unanimously by both houses, and it was signed by Governor Jerry Brown in September of 2011. And it was supposed to it's supposed to force human doctors to learn about what human beings eat. <laughs> and anyway, Wayne and I, even though we worked hard, it did not work out the way we had hoped. Hi, Wayne. Hey. It's so good to see you and congratulations and what an honor to be here uh, with you and uh, Chef AJ and, and just uh, I, I'm super excited and, and uh, you know, um, I am, I'm also excited that, uh, that you just talked to my partner, Ryan Hearing. So it's, oh, it's he's almost great. like, yeah. yeah, it's almost like three generations here um, with, with you being the leaders and the, the pioneers and that really got this lifestyle medicine movement started and and me having the, the immense privilege and opportunity to come in and sort of uh, take it from a, a set of ideas and some, some solid science and, and take it into a little bit more of a movement. And, and Ryan, who knows where he's going to take it next. But uh, th thank you so much for, for all the time and the effort and the work that you put in, the, the arrows that you took over the years um, to, uh, to get lifestyle medicine recognized. And, and, and then Ryan was telling me... Um, about interviews he's seen with you um, and Nathan Pritikin and um, uh, Dr. Um, Burkett and some of these these other people that sort of even before you yes, uh, were trying to move this forward. So it's exciting. Well, it, you know, it's important to have have people like uh, Roy Swank and Walter Kepner and Nathan Pritikin and Dennis Burkett because these were real pioneers. They're the people whose shoulders I stand on. And you know, I'm pleased to hear, I, I don't think of myself much in that, these terms, but I'm pleased to hear that there's a generation of doctors who stand on our shoulders, yours and mine, Wayne. And uh, yeah. you know, they, there's, hopefully it becomes profitable so that more people practice this kind of medicine. Well, to, to give you a sense, um, the meeting that I just left was with the American Board of Medical Specialties. Um, they're very interested in lifestyle medicine uh, getting recognized through ABMS. Um, so this would be a way of, of um, you know, sort of the, the house of medicine, which you and I both have uh, certain different feelings about the house of medicine, but there's a place where it's nice to, to have uh, recognition that this is a valid approach to medicine. You know, I mean, I, I know back in your early days, um, there's a lot of people that question whether it was a valid approach to medicine, but now ABMS itself is saying, this is a valid approach to medicine, let's explore some things. Um, the meeting that I'm gonna have next um, is with a gentleman who's a venture capitalist. And he's basically saying there's a huge win for lifestyle medicine in, in an economic way. Um, and we just have to figure out how to, how to um, uh, work with that and, and really make it something that, that fits in, in the commercial world um, that we have to navigate. Uh, so, so these are the kinds of things that are happening in the lifestyle medicine world. And we, we have over 3,000 people uh, now um, 3,000 physicians now around the world, about 2,000 in the U.S., who are board certified in lifestyle medicine. So it's it's this thing is is growing tremendously. Yeah. Um, and and again, it's it's your shoulders 
it's your work. It's it's all the the blood, sweat, and tears, all all the hard work that you did. So so what an honor for me to to join you briefly and and uh, just congratulations. Thank you so oh, much. Thank thank you, Wayne. It's, it's it's been a real rewarding pleasure to have you as a friend and a colleague to fight some of these battles. And I I know you you and I often were the only two people standing up for some of the important things. And you were we have those stories. Don't we? Didn't yeah. seem to bother you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's part of pushing things forward. Yeah. Dr. Dysinger, your beard is new, and I got to say, it looks fantastic. Well, thank you. It's, it's actually not new, but it's a little longer than usual. It's usually so short that people hardly recognize it. Yeah. Hey, why don't you tell people how they can be involved with your practice? Put a little plug in for lifestyle medicine. Yeah. So, so there's this. Um, so my practice is in Southern California. It's in in the Inland Empire. Uh, region. We actually have two offices, one in Riverside and one in Redland. Um, and we're a primary care practice. So you would come to us if you need a primary care doctor, but we have a lifestyle medicine flavor to everything we do. So, so um, yesterday I gave a patient a big book on plant-based eating, a, a pamphlet of menus and recipes that our dietitians developed. And, uh, you know, everything we do has a lifestyle medicine flavor. We have a lot of groups and those kind of things. We have three doctors. We have one, uh, physician's assistant in our practice. Um, but there's now this larger thing. Um, the larger thing is called Poplar, P-O-P-L-A-R, like the tree, but it's subtat subtitle is the Lifestyle Medicine Network. Um, and at the moment, there's four practices in Poplar. Uh, one, uh, our practice, one in uh, Austin, Texas, one in Jacksonville, Florida, and one in uh, Wilmington, Delaware. Um, but um, in 2023, we have uh, multiple other practices that are lining up to join that. Um, so so uh, the idea of getting a lifestyle medicine physician is going to become easier and easier as we go uh, down the road. And, and certainly, you can join our practice now virtually. We don't require that you sort of be in the Inland Empire to be a, a patient of ours. We prefer that you do, but, but there's no requirement for that. Um, and I know some of the other practices, uh, that's true as well. Um, so, so there's opportunities. So I'm just looking, my next appointment's ready. So I'm going to have to okay. jump off, but, um, so great to see you. Good to see you. And, uh, thank you, Chef AJ for doing this. Well, thank you for hopping by. And when you're 75, right. you can come on too. There you go. No, you can I come look on. forward to that. Yeah. You so, can come on before you're 75. I was just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, but but uh, Chef AJ, you you do such a great job of moving this community forward. So so I just really appreciate well, everything thank, you do. Um, thank and you. And come on I, anytime. I love how you um, you identify the best and describe the best, Chef AJ, and keep us all moving towards the best. Um, that's that's not necessarily an easy thing to do, but you do a great job. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for your work. Okay. Talk to you all later. Take care, Dr. Bye -bye. Dysinger. Bye. So Dr. McDougall, I don't want to keep you too much longer. I There's one question about iron and then we'll ask yeah. that and then we'll get to the trivia questions uh, okay. from Diana. What is the best way to get iron? I took iron supplements, but my levels of mm -hmm. iron didn't improve. I did iron infusion. How do I maintain my iron levels so they don't fall down? I don't want well, to eat red meat, which is what has been suggested. Well. The first thing you do is you make sure you're not bleeding. And the way people bleed that's often not noticed is through the uterus. In other words, heavy menstrual periods, which by the way is fixed when you change your diet and lose weight. And the other source of bleeding that you often don't notice is through the gastrointestinal tract. You could have a bleeding ulcer or a bleeding diverticuli or bleeding hemorrhoids. So what you gotta make sure first of all is that you're not losing blood which is where you direct your attention. And you do that with checking your stool for blood and you should be, it should be obvious if you're losing blood uh, via the vagina from the uterus. So, you know, you set that aside, you're not bleeding. Then they ask the question, well, how, how can I be anemic? Well, you, you're probably eating dairy products. Cow's milk uh, causes anemia, profound anemia. It does it in a couple of ways. One is, Cosmop is, uh, is full of uh, calcium and phosphorus. 
which complex iron from other sources, like from green beans and beef, and you form these insoluble complexes <clears throat> so the iron can't get into the body. And the cow's milk also causes microscopic bleeding in the intestinal tract. And you could take transfusions, you could take iron supplements, you cannot correct this until you get off all the dairy products. And likely that's the problem, I, I would say, based on what we've heard so far. Uh, plants are loaded with iron. And the kind of iron that they have is readily absorbed because this kind of iron, which is ferrous, is converted to the more highly absorbable iron ferric by ascorbic acid vitamin C, which is found in plants. So eating a plant-based diet always gives you plenty of iron. Now, of course, you can hurry up the process by, by taking iron supplements, but there's some risk to that. And, uh, but it, it would be something commonly prescribed in somebody who was trying to correct an, an anemia, uh, is to build up the iron stores more rapidly by taking ferrous sulfate iron pills. Yeah, Great. that's it. Okay, so now we are going to have a, a little contest. I have a couple of trivia questions about you guys. They may not have been answered in today's show, but you've talked about them in other shows. So you have to be watching on YouTube to win. Thanks to Lissa Worson, who generously donated two copies. It's whoever types the answer correctly first. But you have to have your email. If you just type the answer, if you don't have your email, we can't get you the book and you have a U.S. address. And I know Dr. McDougall and Mary, you know the answer to this question. So get ready. The first question for a free copy of Unprocessed, courtesy of Lissa Worson, is where did Dr. McDougall and Mary first meet? Where did they first is, no, is this is this like what city or in what building or in what well, room? It's, it's it's at least it's the story you've said where your eyes first met. At least that's oh, the way yeah. I remember it. I it remember. was a location. It was yeah. a, it was a certain location. Place. Okay. Was it the hospital operating room, Doctor McDougal? It was. I fell in love. <laughs> fell okay, in love. Valerie. Yeah. If you don't get us your email like in two seconds, you can't win. You, that is correct, but you have to have your email. It yeah, was Valerie. Sept September of 1971. She came walking, <laughs> and in fact, she, she was doing a hip. We we're we we're pinning a hip together, and I don't know how that patient ever turned out well because all I was <laughs> was, was fascinated by the nurse. <laughs> So get, uh, Valerie, you're first, but if you don't get us your email pretty soon, we're going to move down to the list because a lot of people had it right. They said working at the hospital, but it was the, op do you remember what the operation was? Yeah, it was the hip surgery. We, had, we were pinning, but it was before artificial hips. And what you would do when somebody fractured their hip is you'd take these long pins, you know, six inch pins, and you would screw them in. So you'd screw the hip back together. And that's what we were doing. She was the, the nurse and I was the medical student. And, uh, and you really, all you saw was this, huh? Yeah. Well, we had to wear masks just like you wear all the time now. Yeah. Wow. I, I mean, it, you know, she, she must have been something <laughs> about her because I've been in love for 50 years. That is fantastic. Now, this next question is a little bit harder, but I know the answer. And the question is, is when Dr. McDougall left Hawaii, he sold his medical practice. Who did he sell it to? And for how much? Oh, that's, that's a good one. one. Da, 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 da. I don't want to think. I, I'm, I would. These are hard. Everybody. These are hard questions. You have to have really faithful watchers to know these well, things. If they want, if they <laughs> want the book, you know, it's going to hum the Jeopardy thing. But I realize if you do that, YouTube flags you for copyright infringement. Because so hopefully oh, really? I won't do that. Yeah. So I did. Uh, but uh, uh, while while they're while they're typing the question, see, it's a tough one. I'm glad. Um, <laughs> what what. Oh, Brian says, what did, what did you say to ask Mary out? Well, that was tough. I, I asked her out and I did, couldn't get a date for three weeks. She was too <laughs> tied up with other engagements. And, okay. But, but, but let me finish this sentence. I, I took her out and, and three weeks later, she finally, she finally consented to go out with me. And, uh, you know, pretty much after that, I won her over. <laughs> it took me, really, it took three weeks before I could get a date. But after that, he couldn't get rid of me. That's so funny. We have a funny answer that you sold it to Atkins for 50000 So some of the people knew it was Dr. <laughs> Shintani, and some of the people knew it was a dollar, but the only person got it all right was another Valerie 
who said, let me find it. I just saw it. She said, Dr. Shintani for a dollar, Valerie Edwards, two people named Valerie one, get us your email and put it in the chat right now. If you want these books, that was fun. That was was fun. Good questions. Yeah, they really were. Well, you know what? Maybe we'll come back and I'll have more. Qu- yeah, though, but I, I I really like Dr. Shintani. He's he's yeah. he's wonderful. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he well, he's he still is. He's a very effective physician. Yeah, in we Hawaii. saw him just the other day. Um, it was uh, in the Hawaii. We did a a presentation for oh, for, Hawaii. for Hawaii to try and get uh, people interested in saving the planet by changing the diet. And in this case, we're talking about changing back to the traditional Japanese diet. He's of Japanese descent. And we were talking about uh, changing the diet back to the traditional Hawaiian diet, which is a diet of taro and breadfruit and sweet potatoes and, you know, the traditional diets. That's what we need to go back to. And these are diets that people have been following for millions of years. Certainly, certainly hundreds of thousands, certainly, I mean, I could date these diets back 10,000 years in each, each circumstance. You know, eating the Western diet is uh, just a blip in history. It's, it's <laughs> something that I hope we can forget. And that is for 50 to 100 years, we've eaten like kings and queens. That's why people are sick. Go back to the traditional eating because pattern. Because of manufacturing plants. Yeah. You know, and, and I used to, I used to uh, ask people to, uh, to get involved in ethnic pride. You know, I used to tell them, look, what's your grandma and grandpa eat? And how, what kind of health are they in? And they would say, well, grandma and grandpa are 90 and they're working in the, in the, in the garden. And what do they eat? Well, you know, they eat, live on <laughs> rice and vegetables or, you know, traditional Hawaiian diet. And but have some pride in your history. Go back to the way you used to eat, like if you're Italian or Asian or black or whatever. Go back to where your ancestors were just a few years ago not doing anything weird. You're just doing something that people always did. Why did you sell the practice so cheap? Well, because uh, it was, uh, I got a job at uh, at St. Lena Hospital. They oh. gave us $10,000 to move from Hawaii, our whole family and all the household. And it was an opportunity I thought that was worthwhile. It was, I got to be associated with uh, the most respected hospital in California. And that gave me credibility. And in those days, I was a bit insecure. You know, I, I didn't like the fact that people associated me with the berries and nuts and, you know, those <laughs> kinds of things. And they thought I was a, a strange doctor. And associating with these famous heart surgeons, I thought it gave me credibility, but I was wrong. I, it didn't really help me at all. And after 16 years, I finally gave up on that kind of nonsense. So uh, we were ready to get out of Hawaii after 15 wonderful years in Hawaii. And I needed a place to hand over my patients. And Dr. Shintani was gracious enough to take over my medical practice for a dollar. <laughs> He's an attorney, you know. <laughs> he, knows how, he knows how to get a good deal. Not just a doctor. He's got a lawyer, lawyer certificate. You know, a dollar doesn't buy what it used to. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> well, you, you, you should have, uh, you got to realize that it wasn't all a blessing. It, it had a lot, of, a lot of problems to take care of, too. <laughs> That is, well, I really think that in honor of your 75th birthday, that somebody should proclaim May 17th National Potato Day. All right, I'll I go like for that. that. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna lobby City Hall or whatever we have to do there because I think that really? would be amazing. I know in your honor, I'm gonna eat a potato as soon as well, we talk. AJ, I want, well, I want you know what we're having for dinner tonight. <laughs> You're having he's we're having eat potatoes with mango salsa. Yeah. yeah. Well, AJ, I want you to know, I couldn't think of anybody I'd rather spend my birthday with oh. than you and your audience. And so we've developed a friendship over the years. It hasn't always been easy, has it, AJ? Hey, I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, really. But, you know, we've developed you, just, you, you know, the problem with you, Dr. McDougall, is you have, like, the best memory, and you, you don't forget anything. <laughs> and right. You literally remember everything that a person said the exact day and minute they said it, so yeah, we right. can't get away with anything. Someone called you a misogynist. I don't even know what it means. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, that, we can tell that story, too. But, but the important thing is, is I want people to realize that what you're doing is is phenomenal. I mean, you are going to become the, the most famous podcaster in the world because you're developing a very positive message, bringing really talented people 
with a bias that's interested in you, the people and to patients and to better health and you don't compromise. Uh, I know you're, you're, you're dedicated to, to bringing out the truth and I'm certainly honored that you continue to have Mary and I come back. Yeah, well, we anytime, and you're, I think you're scheduled for a few more Mondays because we really do want to see the GI talk. Because all we, right, all right, I'll uh, do that. People, right, well, people, remember, we're putting together some other presentations, and they're one on anti aging or aging gracefully, and one on, on postmenopause of women. I'm almost done with that one. And these will be presentations that you'll want to, you want to uh, become involved in. Uh, and also, we have the 12 day monthly internet-based telemedicine program. And we will help you get healthy. We'll help you to get off the drugs. We'll help you to, you know, to have a better life. So take, take advantage of these things too. Right. And to honor Dr. McDougall, eat a damn potato, All people. Right. All right. Oh my God, okay. th so thanks, for this, thanks for the shirt too, AJ. Oh yeah. It looks great on you, Dr. I I'm McDougall. actually going to keep it on. I've got a lecture to give in a couple hours too. The Oh, I group can't we wait. have going. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna change it, but you know, I worked this morning for our for our fireside chat, and I'm just gonna keep it on because I really it's comfortable. It's really yeah, nice. It's, it's beautiful, <laughs> and you know, I can't. The artist is like so excited that you're yeah. wearing this, and she she was just like like, but she's so oh, well. And and you know, you always said you'd rather be hated than ignored. I can promise you, in that shirt, you're not gonna be ignored. All right, <laughs> well, that's good. They'll certainly get an opinion of me, won't they? Absolutely. They won't Thank consider so me much. mild or mellow. <laughs> right. Well, enjoy the rest of your Thank birthday. You. It was so Thank great to see you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my gate gaped. I can't speak. My guest is Dr. Nate Gershwell of The Fasting Escape, and he's going to talk about fasting for reversing chronic medical conditions.